Okay, good morning everyone. We have called the meeting to order and now we are going to turn everything over to Mr. Herb Marlowe. Thank you, sir, for being here today. It's to be here with you. Looking forward to the discussion today. Let me review our agenda for the day. We're in the overview section. Uh, and in a few minutes, uh, the manager will be presenting a strategic plan status. You should have documents in front of you of that. Uh, as we go through it, don't hesitate to ask questions of him. The whole purpose is for you to see where your strategic plan is, what's been accomplished, what's in process, what's being developed early on. As you look at that, I'll ask you to reflect upon, is there anything missing in there? Because in our later item, we'll, we'll turn to that if there's something missing for you. Uh, after we do that, you have the uh, document, the budget presentation. The purpose of this is to let you know your financial situation coming this year. Uh, clearly, uh, to effect a strategic plan, you've got to have resources. This will give you a sense of the resources that you're going to have to work with. Yeah, Marie will be presenting that. Ask her questions about that as, as you will. Uh, then we're going to talk about strategic plan priorities. There's no document for this. This is simply a discussion among the seven of you. Uh, I will ask you out of this whole plan, what's your priority for the coming year? So as you look through it, if you'll think about what I, what I want as a priority, and I'll ask you to share that with, uh, with all of us here so that we'll know where your sense of priorities are. At that time also, if there's anything that you think is missing or not being adequately addressed in the plan, please share that with me. If there's anything you think in there, time passed it by and it's no longer relevant, I'd like you to share that with me. So it's a chance to adapt the plan for this coming year, and that's, that's what we'll do. Uh, after that, we, you know, I interviewed you all, uh, asked anything you'd like to talk about there, that what you see under other discussion development policies. There was some, I'd like to discuss some of our development policies uh, in terms of what's your policies about mixed use, density, et cetera. This is not a policy setting session, it's really just to generate some thought. Uh, depending on the nature of the discussion here, staff may bring you some things back. If there's a clear consensus or a need for further decision, they'll bring a workshop. So it's really just for you to be able to share, yeah, I'm pretty comfortable with this. I'm not comfortable how this is working. What are our choices there? So that's the type of discussion. And lastly, I'll just conclude with a few comments about how do we effectively manage this plan in the future. I do have a two-page PowerPoint, and it'll be available to you by the time we get there. So. Any questions of me before we begin? No questions? Go ahead. Go for it. All right. Thank you. Well, Mr. Manager, show time for you. Thank you, Herb. Um, you all have the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Is somebody controlling the screen? I guess somebody's coming to control the screen, so I don't have to. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you control the screen. <laughs> all right, which one? Okay. All right, Delta 2040, we imagine we develop and we discover. All right, it does work. Um, pathway one uh, is the uh, economic development, the city, well paying job. These are the strategies that you all uh, had last year. And then the next page is the beginning of the individual components. Um, let me get my glass, second glasses on. Um, expand the job base in the city. Uh, strategy one was to develop logistics and distribution districts. Um, what we have done is on each of these, you will see two cogs, a single cog or blank. Two cogs mean we're well on the way, um, or even near completion. A single cog is the process has started, and blank means nothing been done on the element as of now. So the very first one is the Deltona Activity Center, um, and as you see, that has two cogs. Um, the reason for that is we've got an Amazon, we have the, uh, what used to be called the Portland uh, Industry property, it's now I4 Logistics, um, and some other activity going on in that area, but it is well on the way. Can you define uh, the, act can you please define the activity center? Pardon me? Can you please define the Deltona Activity Center? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the Deltona Activity Center is generally that area um, at Graves and Howland, 
uh, down to the movie theater and then down to the power line uh, that crosses Normandy. Uh, it's about, if I remember correctly, somewhere on the order of 600 acres. Um, and it goes to, uh, basically from the high school over to the interstate. It's kind of the four boundaries of that area. And, and the uh, reason— It does go north of Graves, uh, where the interchange is, where Mass Meyer and the vacant property. And, and thank you. The reason I clarify that is this is going to be recorded for the public. There's no one here today, but I want to define, when we talk about the activity center, yes, what does that area mean? Thank you. Okay. Um, within that activity center is the next element, which is the rezoning of the Portland industry property. As I just indicated, the new name for that is I4 Logistics. Um, that, uh, that rezoning has gone through. We are in the process of working on uh, the first building, the site plan, and the plat necessary to make that happen. Uh, and hopefully this spring we will be finalizing the paper part of that where they can start construction. Um, and then development of Rhode Island Road to open development lands. Um, this is being done in three parts. Um, we've already gotten permission from commission to reach out to uh, Frank DeMarch, a property owner uh, where the Integra apartments are, to negotiate a right-of-way um, purchase. Uh, Integra will, pay, will build part of the Rhode Island project, and then as part of the development agreement for um, I-4 and Logistics, they will build a portion of Rhode Island from Normandy to their eastern extreme of their property, which will leave a gap in the middle, which we will be putting the RFQ. Now that we have everything finalized on those two parts, we'll be putting out the RFQ very soon for the consultant to design the, the center portion to be built. So we're moving very quickly on it. The good news is um, the county has come forward um, and said that if we can get engineering studies to show that Rhode Island being built will help the county road network, which we're pretty certain it will, especially with the bridge over I-4, um, that they will utilize their uh, impact fees toward the construction of Rhode Island. Um, and just so everybody knows, their impact fees are significantly higher than ours for roads. So um, that $10 million that we were setting aside out of uh, undesignated reserve looks like it will get paid back or not even utilized um, much quicker than we had anticipated originally. So that's good news on that front. Um, on the next column, and, and let me apologize for those of you all who will be watching this on video and seeing me live. I broke my contact last weekend, so I'm having to wear two different glasses in order to read. Um, develop health care districts. Um, um, the Halifax Health, Halifax Landing Development. Um, we have two cogs on that. Um, obviously, Halifax Health is built, but we are in uh, negotiation with a developer for a 55 and older uh, development, um, basically to the east of Halifax Hospital. Uh, it's an exciting project. Um, it meets a housing need in the community. And, um, and that will help spur some additional uh, activity in that area um, in the healthcare field. And Halifax has indicated that they're ready to start moving on some other things. Um, development of lands along Martin Luther King Boulevard uh, to expand the number of doctor's offices. We do have our first doctor's office out there. It's getting close to opening. Um, and Jerry Mays is working actively with other health care providers uh, about coming to the city. Um, so that is a, a, a two cog. And then family health sorts to draw and retain medical specialists. That is also well on the way. Um, they have been a really good resource for the city. Uh, they have helped out with um, home test kits. Uh, for city employees, for the residents of the community, and other programs. So they have really uh, stepped up and, and 
being a community partner when it comes to the healthcare field. Uh, Mr. Peters, uh, Vice Mayor has a question. Thank you, Mayor. You can ask anytime. Okay, I just want to go back to the uh, Rhode Island mm -hmm. development. Is Orange City involved in this project? Pardon me? Is Orange City involved in this project? Rhode Island? We're 100% involved. No, uh, Orange City. Orange City. Is this is the city of Orange City involved in this project? Uh, we have had to, yes. Um, city of Orange City has signed on um, to the idea of building the bridge over I-4. In fact, they've had some. Uh, we received a letter from the city manager um, of Orange City in support of uh, this road being built. And you know, quite honestly, I think part of the reason for that it takes a lot of pressure off of Graves. Um, you know, it's a, it's a smart move from that standpoint. They've had a lot of development out on Veterans Memorial. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it's starting to have an impact, as all of us know, on the Saxon Apple interchange. Uh, it, it's our belief, and one of the things we spoke to the DOT about is that rather than trying to upgrade Saxon and I-4, which would only have a nominal impact on traffic, it'd be better to give people another alternative. Uh, you know, right now, you have people that drive down Elkham, down Normandy, and up Saxon. If, if Rhode Island was there, they could just you know, go a short distance up Normandy and be on Rhode Island and on the interstate. So um, we believe that there's a need for a fourth interchange in the city, ultimately. So the, so, um, the budget of this project is also includes uh, Orange City budget, am I correct? Ma'am? The city of Deltona is not picking up all the uh, expenses of this, no, also Orange uh, City's involved? No, ma'am. We have, um, at Mr. Fowler's firm, um, Mr. Feeney, uh, former uh, Speaker of the House in the state, former U.S. rep, um, I have talked to him about uh, assisting us with uh, reaching out to the state with the federal dollars that are coming down uh, from the COVID relief and the infrastructure bills that you know, anything we can do to get the I-4 beyond ultimate on that list, the project to be funded from the federal money, or even if it's just putting an interchange at uh, Rhode Island. Uh, would be very helpful to this community, both from a business growth standpoint and a local traffic standpoint. So we're working in all avenues on this. The, I, I, I think that what, what the vice mayor is asking is we have a portion in our, in our city and, we, and Orange City has a, a punch through for Rhode Island that would be on their end and that's a separate, we're not paying for that. It's no, going to be a, a project that is going to involve multiple, multiple things. No, okay, so, yeah, that's it, fine. Co Commissioner um, Bradford, Commissioner Ramos, and then, um, well, we're going to continue. Commissioner Bradford? Yeah, well, that was my question, because to say we're reaching out for state funds and reaching for this and reaching for that, to me, it's great. Don't get me wrong, but that doesn't mean we've secured funding. That doesn't mean, or does it? Do we have a confirmation 100% we're going to get those funds, or it's just a hope? That's one question. And then the other one, what about DeLand? So you reached over to Orange City. DeLand also benefits from this. DeLand is also, from my understanding, right across the street from Halifax, looking at doing major development on that side and, you know, kind of taking advantage of what Deltona is doing right across the bridge. Um, so have they also had a opportunity to wage in on this and where, so I'd like those two questions answered, Delian, and um, I want to know, not that we've reached out and we've inquired, but where do we have secured funds and um, I guess the word would be commitments. Do we have commitments? Not just, yeah, I'm thinking we're going to, we may, we might. I want to know, do we have actual commitments to any of the funding? The, the only commitment at this point is the $10 million we set aside for Rhode Island and the widening of uh, Normandy to Port Lane. Okay, so I think that was Vice Mayor's question. So the 10, so 
we've reached out, but the only commitment, so technically so far, only funds going into it is Deltona's, is what it sounds like to me. Okay. So let me, let me clarify a couple things real quick. Um, the gap from Normandy to um, Veterans Memorial on Rhode Island is a county right away. They already have a 100 foot right away through that strip. So it's really a three party thing. The city of Deltona will be taking care of Howland to Normandy. Essentially, the county will be taking care of Normandy to veterans. And then if we build this road, I would fully suspect that Orange City is going to have to do something about widening their section of Rhode Island from two lanes to four. Um, you know, I have joked with a couple people that in the future, the, uh, the football game between University High and Deltona High will be the, the battle of Rhode Island, uh, because both of them will be on Rhode Island. Um, so the other thing I need to point out is that consultant uh, evaluation of Rhode Island that we need for the county. We were able to get a consultant on board under my spending authority, which is 25,000, they're less than 25. They're already doing that study so that we can present the information to the county so that we can utilize their impact fee toward Rhode Island. So you know, this is in process, very well in process, so that we can take advantage of the county funding toward building Rhode Island. And I, and I guess what concerns me was the comment you just made was the city's responsible from Howland to Normandy, the county's responsible from Normandy to veterans, and Orange City, I would think they would have to. They have a whole I, don't, I didn't hear a commitment. Well, well, I think that right now we're looking at the overview, and when we need to come down to the budget portion of this, we can talk about where the funding is. And I also feel like right now it's really hard to visualize Rhode Island, what we're actually talking about, without a map. So I think, uh, you know, without having a visual, it's really hard to understand. So I think um, Commissioner Ramos, Commissioner McCool, um, have your say, and then we're going we're gonna to take a quick pause and, and and reel this in. Thank you, Madam. I just have a quick question in reference when we talked about the strategy, too. So it's safe to assume, then, that anything from MOK to I-4, uh, we're, we're dedicating as a medical hub, that corridor. It's open for anything as, as it relates to medical, correct? Yes, sir. Perfect. Commissioner McCool? Yeah, and I just want to confirm, what, because what I'm hearing is that we have at least a soft yes from the county in Orange City, because we've had these discussions before. I mean, it's, we, I hear what they're discussing, they hear what we're discussing. I'm just, we have a soft yes. I would, I would say, if your definition of a soft yes, if the staff supports it, you're correct. If your definition of a, uh, a soft yes goes beyond that, then we're beyond that. No, that's what I want, is that they have, this is in their purview, right, and it's a collaborative effort. That's what I want. Most definitely. Okay. Okay, sir, carry on to the next. And then when we get to the budget commissioners, we can talk about specific individual um, uh, about the things. And I, I think that if we have a break, I don't know if it's possible to get a map. And I know that's short notice. If, the, if you guys can print out just a quick map of Rhode Island of where it is. And if you can't, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Ron, then, Ron had one in his office. Okay, perfect. If we can just get that at some point, I think that's a better visual when we're talking about what the city of Deltona's budgetary um, commitment is to what is in our city. And I think that's where the big thing is. Okay. So next. Okay. Um, the next page is expanded job base within the city. Um, strategy. Three is develop the regional convention and meeting market. Um, the first one is a double cog, and that's promoting the center as a premier events facility. Um, Joe Hearns has done an incredible job in this last year. Um, we have now got the chambers, we got the rotary, um, we have even have a combined chambers. Uh, we're working on a major announcement with regard to the uh, 
the Masonic Lodge. And uh, so Joe had been doing an incredible job uh, promoting the center and getting things moving there at the center. Um, and then ongoing effort to attract hotel motels, uh, accommodating visitors to the center in Halifax Hospital. That is a double cog because we are talking to a number of people. And in the developer, we understand from talking to uh, uh, people associated with the developer of, of the uh, activity center that they are also in very deep talks with a uh, hotel you're about coming to that property so there's a lot of activity going in the background um, and I'm pretty confident that we will be seeing some announcements here in the not too distant future with regard to hotels um, under strategy four identify emerging opportunities and markets. Um, once again, a double cog, uh, ongoing effort for the City Department of Economic Development. Um, Jerry has um, been doing a lot of outreach. Um, I think Jerry will also tell you that part of the reason he is having the success that he's having right now is because of the direction that the commission has given in the last year or two. Um, you know, opening up Rhode Island, um, making an effort to get sewer in the properties that are currently unsewered. Uh, all those efforts are starting to pay back. Um, and we'll talk about the sewering of property in a few minutes, but um, you know, we have a very strong economic development policy. This, this commission has un unanimously been supporting um, and we're starting to reap the rewards for that. So I wanna applaud the commission uh, for your uh, support in that area because it definitely is showing uh, an impact. Madam Mayor. Yes. Go next ahead. page. Do you want us to ask Com Com Commissioner Bradford has a comment. Yeah, do you want us to wait until he's done or do you want us to ask questions as we go through the pages? Um, I think you can just ask questions as we go through the pages, but if they're pertaining to budget, then we'll put them okay, under no, the this budget. Is not. This, let's go back to the center. <clears throat> and I wrote just a couple things down. Um, so you said Joe's got the Masonic Lodge and the Chamber events going there which is great to have recurring events. What other events, like we have, you know, our normal bonkers, and I think some of the dances, <clears throat> what additional events are we doing there? Because um, what I'd love to see is more community events happening at the center, because the more community events we have, the more people are going to attend the center and be like, wow, I didn't even know this was here. So as it's great to have these recurring meetings, that means you've got the same people showing up pretty much each, each month to those events or weekly, whatever. Um, so what I'd like to see a focus on is us having more community events there. We're doing events in our parking lot here. We're doing events. We need to have more outreach, more events, more little festivals and things going on at the center. Um, the only way you're going to get exposure is if we expose it ourselves, and that's just a personal opinion on that. If, but if we, I may, if I may make yes. you happy, um, with um, our event coordinator uh, retiring, um, we have already had discussions about upgrading the position. One of the problems that we have in Deltona is we have a very robust. Parks and Rec Department and very robust Parks and Rec facilities. Amen. But we don't bring in enough revenue to support it. And one of the best ways to bring in revenue is through events. And so the challenge that I have given the department, we are going to review that events coordinator position to be more like the events coordinator position over somewhere like Mount Dora where they have 26 events a year. Is that an event coordinator through Parks and Rec or over at the center? That to be worked out, okay? okay. We, we, it, in, in the embryonic stage, we don't know if it's a boy or a girl yet. Well, um, so, um, you know, I don't care if it, it's a boy it's or a girl. Right, we, we know we're pregnant, but we're not sure which way yet. So as we develop it, we'll let you know. Um, what I'm envisioning, is what I would like personally, but my staff will tell me I've lost my mind, is I would like to have an event coordinator more associated with the city manager's office who coordinates with both Parks and Rec and the center. 
Uh, that way we get better utilization of our facility. Certain events are going to be better at the center. Certain events are going to be better at Dewey Boster or wherever it may be. Um, and, you know, what I want to do is open up the city to having more events. It, as you just indicated, you know, we, we had a very good meeting with the food truck vendors the other night. A couple of them won't say that, but I think most of them will say it was a good meeting. Um, after the meeting, somebody brought up the point that you know, they had basketball tournaments on Saturday mornings at West Quile. And you know, he had been asked, can you have your tr truck out here on Saturday morning so people have something to eat? I told him to get with Ryan and Mark and we will make it happen. So, so are, we, we need to open up. What, what we're doing right now, we're supposed to be doing an overview of a strategic plan and we're getting in the weeds on every single item. Mm -hmm. And we need to go ahead and Commissioner Bradford, if you have a, a very valid question and under strategic plan priorities, I think that can be brought up, okay. uh, community events. Um, Vice Mayor, and then did you want to speak? Did you? No. Yeah, well, because I think we'll do the overview and when you can list some things, then we're going to talk about um, what your priorities are. Am I right, Herb? And yeah. we need to, otherwise we'll be like, right. then we're going to get to that point and rehash again. So carry on, Mr. Peters. Okay. Um, on the next page, Herb, you, I'll do it. Okay, thank you. Um, strategy number no, I've already talked about that one. Uh, you should be on ecotourism. Eco All right, I'm on the goal two now. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Develop the ecotourism economy. Uh, strategy one, we have a single card, which is the uh, implementation, implement the ecotourism plan, develop uh, a development and marketing plan and promote ecotourism. Um, we had a gentleman that was working for us that was helping with that outreach. Uh, he left us. Um, we just had interviews and we'll be hiring a couple of people that will be able to get that process started. Uh, so we will be moving that to a double cog here in the next couple of months. Uh, so we will be back on that. Um, that also is somewhat related to the um, the eco, eco projects that we were talking about recently, getting them moving. And so um, we have an item on the agenda for Monday night to get one of those two projects that we need to get done moving. Strategy two is position and market the city as a trail center. Uh, once again, a single cog, and uh, for the reasons I just gave you, um, that's why it's a single cog, but we'll be moving to a double cog here very soon. Um, next slide, strategy three, is increase accessibility of various eco features of the city. Um, double cog is pursuing accreditation of Parks and Recreation Department. Um, that is started in pursuing funding to support accessibility through uh, Duke Energy grants and ECHO. Um, Duke Energy recently gave us $10,000 toward um, uh, constructing blinds so that people can go like the Audubon Park and not be out in the open to distract the birds and what have you. And um, that will be uh, coming here very soon. Uh, we are going to be pursuing the ECHO grants. I have told staff that I want to start having larger projects uh, instead of smaller ones. Um, we can afford the small ones, uh, we can't afford the large ones. And I think Ms. Northy, who's on the ECHO board, has indicated that also, that, that we need to start pursuing larger grant projects. Um, in addition to that, we are going to be looking at opportunity for uh, other corporate uh, naming rights and things of that nature. Um, as I was explaining to some of my staff members when I was up in Raleigh uh, last weekend, you know, you have PNC Park, you have Bank of America Park, you have so-and-so park. Uh, they get corporate sponsorship on an annual basis for naming rights, and that's a way to offset local costs. Strategy four is foster and communicate an eco-brand for the city. 
Um, once again, for the same reasons I gave a few minutes ago, it's a single cog, but it will be moving to a double cog here pretty soon. Commissioner McCool, did you have a question on this section? I did. I just wanted to be reminded of how far away we are from completing our other ECHO projects. You know, the ones that are like currently, do we have a, a time frame? Will we be open next year, Mr. Peters, to pursue more ECHO funding for critical projects? Yes, ma'am. Exceptional have two, projects? We have two projects that we need to get off our plate so that we can pursue future funding. Uh, you have one on Monday night, and uh -huh. uh, we will have the second one to you, uh, I would hope, within the next four to five months. So once we get those under construction, we'll be able to pursue, the goal is to be able to pursue the August time frame yeah. for the next round of funding. And one, and one of those critical, I don't want to get in the weeds, but isn't one of those what we called, what was the term that we used, exceptional or something that where we could get an extension of time? Do you, do you remember? Pardon me? The, uh, the echo funding as it is, right? We didn't qualify because we had projects for the, a certain funding period. Yes, two, two are not complete, and you can't, you cannot apply cannot, if you're not no, complete. Under the ECHO guidelines, we cannot pursue additional funding when we have outstanding projects. Now, my understanding is that if we're under construction with a defined completion date, then we can. Yeah, okay. And then we can, because there's two, two it's my understanding. Our, our goal there, to be ready for the fall funding. There are cycle. two cycles this year for funding for ECHO. So wasn't there a caveat that if we, it was an exceptional project or something like that, that we could still reapply for extra funding? Wasn't if, it that was, the, if it was a project that's already started. It's what I remember, yes, but you can apply for a new project. I get that concept, but I thought that there was a caveat that you could, as long as one of those projects uh, were delay under exceptional circumstances or something like that, you could still apply for new funding. Right, if the project I don't wanna, is yeah. already started. Okay, I don't so want to get in the, the weeds process. with it. I just want to, at this future time, straighten me out on that as far as what our, well, I, I just, from what, what you're saying, Mr. Peters, is that for the second round of ECHO funding in the fall, we will be able to apply. That is the plan, ma'am. I'm very much aware of what Ms. McCool was talking about, and that is why we're planning to be ready for fall. Okay, I'm good. Okay, under goal three, develop the infrastructure and land needed for business development. Um, strategy one, target commercial infrastructure. Um, while it is a single cog, I personally believe it should be a double cog for Deltona Boulevard and Jackson Boulevard plan. Uh, we have a consultant on board. They're doing the preliminary design now. Their design team includes uh, John Wanamaker, uh, who is assisting us in what kind of assemblage we would need to create viable commercial properties. Um, and very soon we should have the preliminary design and we will be author coming back to commission to authorize the final design and then proceed to construction. So it is definitely well on the way in the Deltona Boulevard, Saxon Boulevard, and what I should say is our Southwest CRA area because that's really where it is. Um, Double cog is advocate for economic development oriented roadway improvements, uh, such as the interchange at I-4 in Rhode Island um, and other improvements that we're looking at in that area. So we're definitely well on the way. And, and then the double cog at county impact fees, this relates back to the letter that we received from the county indicate, uh, email. Uh, that if we did a study on Rhode Island, that it would open up the potential to use county impact fees. Um, just to kind of expand on that a little bit, um, you know, the county has, I think, five districts in which they put out the impact fees. The amount of available impact fees in, in Deltona is not a very large pot of money. My recollection is about a million and a half dollars. Uh, but, you know, as we get more development coming in, that number will increase. But, um, so we're working on that one. Then strategy number two is land acquisition and assembly. Um, a single car 
Park is, as many of you all may not know, um, we have a road called Welcome Way. It starts at the Waffle House, crosses Deltona Boulevard, and goes over to Doyle by Hardy's. That is a private road. Um, and we have had a number of problems with uh, truck parking on the road, uh, just a general poor condition, the sidewalk issues and all that. And unfortunately, it's multiple ownerships. So we're working with those multiple ownerships to get that turned over to the city so it can be a public road, because there are some parcels along that road that if it was a public road, I believe it would uh, enhance the opportunity to develop the, I believe it's three parcels that's available. How, far, how close are we for that, and what's a, what is a projected budget cost, which I'll ask in the budget, but that road is a private road. If we dedicate it, we're responsible for the maintenance, and what is the reality of the, the um, parcel owners actually doing some development? It's a Welcome Center Drive, and it's well, been there. Well, that's that part of our overall communication. Um, I think we would see more interest when they have interest in their property. Uh, so they're probably going to go hand in hand, ma'am, and the reality is that when those parcels develop, there'll be impact fees that are associated with them. Um, as part of those development, they will fill in the gaps in the sidewalk. Uh, we so, already did that for some mm -hmm. of them. We already, we already put sidewalk on that street that's not ours. That was by accident, yes, ma'am. Um, but um, the road is not in deplorable shape. Um, it, uh, probably 10 years away from needing to be repaved. So the impact fees would essentially offset that cost. Okay, Commissioner McCool, are you still on the board or was that? Yes. yes. Thank you. And then Vice Mayor. Mr. Peters, I wanted to go back over the county impact fees. I just want to understand really briefly how it is those um, districts or are awarded, the, how is that determined, how much impact fee we get? Um, the county had districts that I believe pretty much follow the county districts, so technically yep. six of them. Um, and what they do is, for instance, if a development comes in in District 5 uh, and there's impact fees, it goes into the pot of money for District 5. Um, you know, to give you a comparison, you know, we're, I think, I, I don't have the chart with me, but I think we're around one and a half million. Uh, by contrast, District 1 that has all the new development in Victoria Park and all that has almost 15 million. Um, I think they're the largest pot of money in all the districts in the county. In, in Deltona, we have one of the smallest. Uh, and that's just based on development and what road projects. Okay. I want to ask also, didn't we have a study done for our impact fees? Didn't we hire a consultant for our city impact fees, right? They were doing a study we, on that? We did. We're working through that, and we'll be coming back to the commission with a recommendation for modifying our impact fees within this short distance. And I understand that we're limited by law, right, and rules, what we can get, but I also believe, and it's just just a thought. I believe that we're leaving some meat on the bone. So I want us to make sure that we're pursuing as piranhas and not goldfish because there's a lot out there that is available, but a lot that we can't, we're limited by the state. We've been pretty much kneecapped. I know that you know this. I'm saying this for public edification <coughs> because we are being more and more limited by what we can actually get. So there again, piranhas, not goldfish. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to make a comment going back to the uh, welcome weight um, road that um, Mr. Peters just spoke about, that it's not part of the city of Deltona. However, I just, because this is being taped for the record, um, we've had so many complaints about rubbish being dumped around the area, and we still have been able to uh, clean it up. So I just want to make that for the record, because that's around District 3, and we have been bombarded with complaints about mattresses and stuff, and still the city has gone out and cleaned it up. Thank you. Okay. And 
All right, continuing on strategy um, two, the last one is a double cog, and that is to uh, expand sewer connection uh, to commercial areas. We are actively looking at ways to do that. Uh, we've been working with new development to put in additional manholes and short stubs and lines so that we have the ability to connect commercial properties in the area to new development and new infrastructure that's being put in. Uh, so this is a very active and ongoing process that we are doing throughout the city. Um, number continuing under goal four. Um, Improve the community's understanding of economic development process. Strategy one is information and uh, education. Um, as part of our overall uh, plan for a city of villages, uh, we plan to have a series of workshops. Um, and we will be, as part of those workshops, we will be talking about economic development. Uh, economic development, let me remind everybody, everybody thinks that economic development is the, the new businesses, um, but the most important part of economic development is taking care of the existing businesses. What we can do to help them stay in business, what can we do to help them expand and thrive, and um, so um, the community meetings will be just as important for the existing shopping areas, the existing businesses that are in our community uh, on the things that we can do to help them do better. Uh, all right, pathway two, community development, redevelopment, and gallery of villages. It's, um, to remind everybody, um, the gallery of villages with the concept that um, you have a piece of canvas um, that is basically the infrastructure, the availability of the land, and the code requirements. Then you have the actual painting, which is the housing development, the commercial properties and that type of thing, that's the painting, and then the, what type of frame do we have? My joke at the time was, would you have a gilded gold frame on the Mona Lisa, or would you have a uh, reclaimed barn wood frame on the Mona Lisa, which one would, is appropriate? And when the community and we decide what kind of frame uh, that we have, so that's the whole concept of the uh, uh, gallery of villages. Um, so under that, strategy one is incorporate prior planning. Um, we have a single cog on that. We are in the process of reviewing our uh, planning process, um, including development review, uh, need to redo the land development code, uh, candidly, we have been so busy working on food trucks, um, impact fees, uh, rental ordinance, uh, those types of things that you know have some financial implications and current application. But as soon as we come out of that, we will be coming forward with hiring a consultant to help with rewriting the land development code. Um, and, you know, that's something that we'll probably have to have a separate strategy session with the commission as to how far we want to go. Um, you know, land development code can be very sophisticated or they can be very simple. Um, I would make the argument that the current code we have right now, because we have low density residential with anything from zero to six units to an acre. In most municipalities, that would be zero to two low density, two to four medium density, and four to six high density. You know, so we have one single district where most other communities would have three. So those, what level do we want to achieve with the new land development code? Um, and we will be coming back uh, 
certainly to have that discussion with you all. Um, then, you know, coming out of that would be develop village master plan. Master planning a part of land development code revision, revamp development review process, uh, ensure land use map and zoning maps are consistent, and community scoping to review, select, and development, select land development requirements. That's all of what I just reviewed with you. Um, Mr. Peters, um, Commissioner Sosa and Commissioner McCool are on the board. Commissioner Sosa? Yeah. One of the biggest issues I've seen here in Deltona is our land use. And I want to know why we didn't prioritize at least modifying the land use, because most of the issues we have is with overdevelopment. That's, when we have a full chamber, it's all because of a rezoning. My question is, why do we make food trucks a priority and spend so much time on food trucks when they're not an overwhelming problem and we just kind of kick the land use to the side? You know, I think, I'm not sure where we're at with the land use, but I think that should have been a top priority. Because to be honest with you, by the time we actually get around to getting this plan done, you know, we're, we're not gonna have much areas left to, to discuss with land use. So um, I, I personally think the land use ought to be the top priority. I mean, that's my okay. personal opinion. I, I appreciate that. I would remind you that the uh, food truck with the consensus of the commission, that they want that dealt with. Um, when it comes to the land use side of it, as I have said to you all before, uh, it's my personal belief that you know your land development code is broken when you get all the uh, plan unit developments. Um, but the truth of the matter is the planned unit developments are in fact a form of zoning regulation. Um, the, what we have been doing is part of the, the pods that we've been dealing with. If we've been doing things such as, I don't, you know, it's not true performance zoning, but we have been doing a form of performance zoning to where, okay, you start with this many units per acre, if you're doing these extra things like protecting the wetlands or protecting the floodplains or you know, protecting trees, we'll give you that consideration in terms of your overall development. So in a form, each one of the planned unit developments that have been coming to you all or will be coming to you soon is a better way to say that. You will see a shift in how they are being done to incorporate more modern development practices. Um, and I think while we haven't been actively rewriting the land development code, we have been actively handling the planned unit development in a different manner that's more in keeping with what the city wants. So I appreciate what you say. Mr. Paradise will tell you that he doesn't like coming in my office because I always ask him where are we are with getting somebody on board to start the land development code. Um, and so, you know, it's an emphasis of mine, it's an emphasis of ours, but you know, he always asks me what's the priority and we have to have that discussion. Um, but we will be getting to the land development code soon. What is your ETA to get to it soon? I'm not even gonna to try to touch that one, sir. No. I, I mean, I can tell you that the Barry, um, when my wife was on the Berry Council three years ago, they put land development code change in there. They actually hired a consultant three years ago and they still haven't finished. So, you know, a lot of it is going to depend on how much, as I said a few minutes ago, we'll come back to you and we're gonna have a strategic planning session about the land development code. Um, and, you know, you, you can make it ridiculous um, you know, Fairfax County, Virginia, every single parcel is his own district. Now, you can imagine what their land development code book looks like. Mr. Peters, I yep. think that we have a section on here that's development policies, mixed use, and I think Commissioner Sosa, um, for you, um, 
a priority would be the land development code when we hit that, and, and you're not wrong about that. I think we need a, you know, we need to have that. We need to define our priorities. That's what this session is for today, is to define our priorities. And if there's a commission consensus that the land development code is a priority, then we need to address that, and we need to find out the funding, and we need to figure that out. And I think that can be um, put under uh, your, your priorities. I, I definitely agree. Are you okay with that, putting yes, that as, uh, bringing that forth as a priority? Commissioner McCool, and then Commissioner Bradford, and then Herb, did you want to take a break now, or do you want to continue to go on? What is? Why don't we try to get till about 10, and then we'll okay. take a break. Okay, 10 o'clock, perfect. Commissioner McCool. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, hallelujah, Commissioner Souza. My point exactly. Because when we're talking about strategizing how we're going to develop the rest of our city, I asked the question, what is our capacity? 125,000 people. We're at 120,000 people right now. We don't have that much more to develop. And I am making my thoughts on that public, that we must be good stewards of what we have left. And we can't do that if we don't have a proper vision for that. You know, that's I, why I, I, it, is, it has to be a priority. Then we'll put that under strategic plan priorities when we get to that. that and that is fantastic. Listen, I get hit with this all the time, but I don't, I, I don't see why there cannot be a moratorium until we figure out what we're doing with the rest of what we have, the last of the dying breed, the rest of what we have left. Because I tell you this right now, we start talking about doing this, we prioritize this, and we're going to have a lot of development jackhammered through here in a rush, in a, in a gold rush, to get through before we prioritize what? What do we have left? And that's baloney. So I'm all about putting this, making this move forward, whoever we have to get, whatever we have to do. We have no, we, there's no more juice to squeeze out of developers as far as impact fees go, as far as paying for what we already have. I just want us to be, I just want this to be a top priority for us. The rest of what we do, the, what we do with the rest of Deltona says a lot about how we're moving forward. And if we don't have anything to work with, what are we saying? I know that we have all this beautiful development coming up business I'm not trying to scare that away but we only have so much left of so much stock so well, well, Commissioner Com Sosa I'm with you on that Commissioner McCool again we'll put that under strategic plan priorities and Commissioner Bradford and then um, we'll continue thank uh, you Madam Mayor I'm going to talk to this under priorities as well because they are correct. Um, I think it's been a year. We almost did a moratorium, and we were assured it was going to be addressed. So I will discuss it during that as well. And I think, commissioners, when we get to that point of strategic plan pri priorities and the land development code, it's going to tie in with the budget, because if we want to do this right, we cannot have staff doing this as part of their job when they're already overwhelmed. And then we need to go ahead. It, that's what this planning thing is for, to decide how we're going to prioritize what we want and put the budget accordingly and understand, commissioners, that that is going to mean a shift in funding. It is going to make, I mean, Commissioner McCool, you don't have to roll, roll your head like that. That's the reality of it. If we're going to go ahead and spend $300,000 on a land development code consultant and bring somebody in and say we want it done in a year to a year and a half, it has to be funded. And those $300,000 have to come out of something else. And I was nodding my head in recognition and of what you're saying is absolutely true, and I get that. So it's about what we find as a priority. And that, and that's why we have strategic planning. It's like a blueprint of what we're going to do for the next year, next two years, next next five years. So, Mayor. Vice Mayor, and then we're going to move on. Thank you, Mayor. And I also want to remind the, the commissioners up here in the dais, staff does what we instruct them to do. So we also have to keep in mind what the priorities are and stop putting them underneath what we think should be addressed ASAP. So we also have to keep that in mind. Staff works under our direction. So our, we have to tell them what the priorities are so they can work on them. Mr. Peters. Thank you, ma'am. Um, back to goal, uh, pathway to goal two, strategy one, entryway, develop entryway for major city entrance points, villages, and economic districts. Um, 
we have started the process, but we're obviously not getting there yet. Improve entry signs and Halifax Landing city logo location. Uh, this with the concern with the logo being on the side of the Halifax Landing signs. Um, we are looking at some options, but at this point we have not come up with any. Um, banners and signs develop physical structure to post banners as needed. Um, and then update sign ordinance as part of the land development code. Then pathway two, goal two. Okay, let me make sure I'm moving in the right direction here. Okay, strategy, next page on strategy three. Identify physical features that distinguish each, uh, each village. This is inventory and master planning. This is where we will reach out into the community. Um, it may be a lake, it may be a tree, it may be a certain park, um, but we will identify the unique piece, physical features for that area um, and then build a, um, a master plan around that feature and that village. Um, strategy four is to maintain the quality of the city's appearance. Uh, and this is develop the rental home uh, inspection program. Uh, that should be two cogs because we've done quite a bit of work on this. As it is right now, we have a, um, um, a plan going forward to uh, get this done. And um, the goal is to have it done for next year. Um, I'm sorry, um, the mayor has stepped down for a few minutes. Well, Commissioner, you have a question? Commissioner Bradford? Just a question, right, Mr. Peters. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. Going back to goal two, strategy one, and your goal two, strategy three and four. I guess I'm a little confused, and help me understand this. Okay. We only have one spot there. So this makes me go, how are we prioritizing how is economic development doing what they need to do and how is everybody doing what they need to do? Because in order for us to know which way we're going, don't we need to have these entryways kind of planned out? So if we don't know this is gonna be at this entrance and this is gonna be here and this is gonna be here and this is gonna be here, how does economic development and everybody know what they're doing if we haven't defined that? Hi, right. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, you're talking about the villages or you're talking about economic development or both? <clears throat> I'm talking developing our entryways for major city entrance points. Okay. So I guess I get confused because it's like economic development is got to be hand in hand with what is going on with that. And if we don't have these entry points outlined, how are they able to know what they're going after and what they're supposed to be doing and promoting and doing all that? Yeah. A lot of this goes hand in hand, as I indicated a few minutes ago. We need to have a series of workshops around the city. Because the first thing we gotta do is, is come up with the community desire for their village. Um, it may be the people on Deltona Boulevard wanna have their own unique village. Um, and then, you know, as you move off of Deltona Boulevard, they, the residential areas may be, you know, the village of, you know, um, whatever. Um, some of them are going to be easy, like Deltona, I mean, the, um, the activity center is a village in and of itself. Uh, that's going to be an easy one. But when you start getting into subdivisions and things like that, for instance, if you go down Alcam going east, um, the, the, the lake kind of subdivides the villages. Then you get into the commercial district at, at Howland and, and Alcam. That may be a village. Right, and I understand all that. That's, that's the whole concept. I do understand that. Right. So without that being done, one, we're talking about land development code. How do we even do that? because that land development code's gotta be based around these different villages. So you may say that, like some cities have, um, I won't mention their names, 
um, you can't go paint a building because all their commercial buildings have to be painted a certain color and they have to have a certain design and all that, right? So how do we do this if we don't have, to me, the community engagement and having these entryways defined, that's like part, the, the major part of the strategic plan. So we'll, I'll address that as, again, we go down into priorities. But I just didn't know if you already had that a little bit farther. I'm just a little confused how we're even doing too much without this part being done already. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bradford. Mr. Anyone you, else? Or? No, nobody else is on the line. Okay. All right. Mr. Peters? Um, yeah. All I can say, it's a process. You know, and as I said a few minutes ago, when we have the meeting to talk about land development code, a lot of that discussion is going to be the level of sophistication that you want the land development code. For instance, if we, let's say we designate 25 villages in the city, are we gonna have 25 different development standards? Or are we gonna have one development standard that we try to apply with an overlay district that applies to those villages. Crazy example, the village of Pinehurst, North Carolina. You have to have white clapper buildings and you have to have dark green awning. Now, we're not gonna go that far, I hope, but that would be an overlay district for a certain area. Um, and you know, it may be that you know, we start with 25 villages and have more as new developments come in, but Part of the discussion we need to have with you all is if there's a desire to go to a more sophisticated form-based land development code or do you want to keep it simple with overlay district or you just want to keep it simple. There's so many different flavors. And one of the things that I caution is I know there is a desire to get a new land development code done. But we need to remember that for, for the most part, our land development code came over from Volusia County 27 years ago. Um, and you know, the most changes that we have made in the land development code, from what I understand, is that we had changed the parking stuff about 17 times. Is that approved? And so the point being is we have got to decide what it is we want to achieve with the land development code so we have some direction. That's gonna be a whole different strategic planning process. And Mr. And Peters, would this, would this fall on the develop, development policies, the topics that we're discussing right now? Well, I think what we need to do with regard to policy is y'all need but will to that fall, Does that fall under that subject? Because we Pardon can me? carry on this conversation. Yeah, we, we, can, we can handle policies. that with the, uh, you know, y'all can give us a policy statement okay, later. Okay, that's fine. You okay with that, yeah. Commissioner? Okay, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor, if I may, we're at 10 of 10. Uh, there's obviously a lot of discussion needs to occur around the strategic plan priorities, and I'm worried we're not going to have sufficient time for that. I wonder if y'all would be amenable to, uh, over the break, looking through the rest of the PowerPoint, if there are certain slides you have questions about, rather than have Mr. Peters go over every one, uh, and that way we can hopefully get through that. I'd like to propose we try to finish that by 10.30. Then what I'd like to do, instead of having to reprint the budget, talk about the budget, let's talk about your priorities first. And then I'm gonna ask her on the fly, if there are issues she's heard there that are gonna raise budgetary issues for you so you'll be aware of it. Uh, and that way, hopefully we can get those two things. I view that, I, I think that's such a critical discussion I'll need to have about priorities. I really would like to have sufficient time for that, if that would be acceptable to y'all. Turning the meeting back to the mayor. Okay, so Herb, you wanna go ahead and change the format, feel free, okay. whatever you. All right, okay. So what I'd like to do is let's go ahead and take a break now. We'll give you uh, 20 minutes. I'll ask you in that time to flip through this PowerPoint. If there are certain slides you have questions about, when we come back, we'll do that, but we won't try to go over the whole thing. You, you can see it there. Uh, but I'd like to conclude the discussion of the PowerPoint by 10.30 if we may to give you at least an hour to talk about priorities, if not Perfect. So, all right. We'll go ahead and adjourn then for 20 minutes. All right. Okay, is that good for you, time-wise? good for me. Perfect. Fine. 
Well, if you want to go over everything and you want to look, do you want to take 15 commissioners? What do you prefer? 15, 20? You tell, you tell us. Let's take 15. Perfect. If, you know, try to get through this, just scan it. If there's a slide you want to have questions about, fine. If not, we'll, we'll set it aside. So, Perfect, 15 right. minute adjournment. Thank you, sir. Okay, Thank you. commissioners, timer is going. Okay, Mr. Marlowe, everybody's here, right? The commission's back. Um, okay. No. All right. Can you hit that refresh button, please? Do we need to hit refresh? All of us? Yes. Everybody, please hit refresh. Everybody's hitting refresh. You're going to need more than a Starbucks when this is over. <laughs> okay, Mr. Marlowe. Okay, are we ready? We are ready. Uh, uh, let me talk, uh, y'all obviously have, there's some document surfacing y'all would like to talk about. We're trying to get copies of those. Uh, let me talk about maybe a, another modification of the process. Uh, rather than try to continue through this, if you can, uh, you, you see there's a pathway, a goal, and a strategy. If you will go through, and not at this moment, but uh, pick out the pathways, goals, and strategies you want to talk about, two, one, three, just like that. If we have time today, we'll do it. If not, we'll give those to the manager and he will figure out a way to have a further conversation with you about okay. it. There's a lot of work staff have done. It's good work. I, I don't want to disparage it at all. It, it, they have really done a lot, but we have a limited amount of time and you'll obviously have some things you need to talk about. So again, if, if, if while we're talking here, if you'll just go through it and mark whatever pathway, whatever goal, whatever strategy you'd like to have some further discussion about, uh, would that be acceptable? Yes. Okay, all right. So what we're gonna do now is turn to strategic plan priorities, but under that, you see 5A, you'll already surface that, that's clearly a, a priority you wanna talk about. Uh, what we're gonna do is I'd like to have that conversation till about 11.30ish, uh, somewhere in there. Then I'd like a five minute break so Marie and I can confab real quickly. Y'all will identify things in that conversation. Some of those we will know a number, generally what it will cost, others we won't. But I want to be able to say, now, you know, if, if this is something you want to pursue, this is sort of the budgetary impact, uh, whether it's a number or it's just a big number. And then she will present to you various scenarios for your uh, ad valorem rates. So that we can have start to become a real discussion about is this something that's really going to happen here or not. Now you're not setting tax valorem rates today. Please let me be clear about that. This is just a discussion of we want these things as priorities. These things cost. Here's the money we have. It's the same we all have to do personally. You know, is what we got, what we want, and where we're going to prioritize. So that'll be our discussion. So around 11.30, I'd like to draw this discussion to a close so that we can have a budget discussion. Uh, you see at the end, I have a effect in this thing, but I'll, I'm gonna do it real quick. One's having a focus, y'all have that. You know, you're trying to build businesses here, protect quality of life. You got lots of goals, obviously. The other key, you know, you have all the goals in the world, but if you don't put the resources to them, they're not gonna happen. So that's why we're gonna have that discussion. The other key part, is you have to have the organizational capability to do it. You have both the policy leadership and the staff skills. Organizations, you, if you have the money, but if folks can't manage that money well, if they can't organize themselves and produce, it doesn't happen. So those are all the sort of keys. If I have a little time, I'll wrap up with that, but uh, if I don't, I've said it. <laughs> so, okay, so let's start talking about priorities. Uh, and what I'd like to do is I'd start to like with Commissioner King and just go right down the row. For you, the priority this coming year is? Well, I think one of my biggest priorities is what we've talked about some this morning, uh, and that is um, the way we go about our development. Okay. Um, first of all, you know, let me start by saying this community 
um, survives, or this government survives, because of the taxes of the people. And in our situation, we got way more people paying taxes than we got business and, and commercial, uh, industrial paying taxes. And, and I think we're seeing now a shift. Uh, it's, I think it's very important for us to have commercial that can carry the, the burden of the taxes in the city. Um, we need to do everything we can to reduce the taxes of our citizens by de putting in good business and commercial development that will obviously benefit our residents because they'll be able to work close, closer to home, shop. they'll be able to shop here, mm -hmm. they'll be able to be entertained here, mm -hmm. they won't have to leave mm -hmm. and go all over the world to get anything they want because it's been very difficult in my 23 years here to get the things that I want and want to go do mm -hmm. for entertainment and that sort of thing. I have to go somewhere else, and most everybody else does too. Okay. So I think that is a huge priority okay. is to what, and, I, and I've been accused of being um, anti-development. I am not anti-development. I am, I am smart development. I'm anti-silly development. Um, okay. We need to be, uh, we're, like, we're like this mm -hmm. with the burden being our, our citizens and we need to turn that around to where business uh, is carrying the load. So, so a better balance of your property values between commercial and residential yeah. uh, and an increased property valuation overall from the exactly. commercial. So, so I think that's very important. I think the other thing is, um, we are way over developing uh, when it comes to our housing. Okay. You know, we can talk, oh, we need to be diverse. We have to have different kind of housing. Well, listen, we now have 2,000 new homes approved for Deltona. Um, all of them are going to look the same. They're all on small lots, okay. expensive houses on little bitty lots. Okay. And um, we need to change that. Okay. Um, our our um, land use has to change. Uh, we can't we can't continue um, we can't continue to have a, a a rule that says low low density is um, one to six homes per acre. Um, it it needs to have a a stratified mm -hmm. uh, look to it, one to two, one to two you know, Three two to four, four, mm -hmm. four to six. Okay. Um, it, we have to do that. Okay. Um, you know, we've got apartments coming in, we've got these small lot houses coming in, we've almost depleted our, our agriculture uh, property, mm -hmm. almost all gone. Um, RE1 now is under attack. Um, uh, we want to we want to put houses, uh, apartments, and so on right in the middle of RE1 properties. We have to prioritize and get that right. Okay. And I, so those are my top priorities. Great, thank you, Commissioner Cool. My top goal for our city is smart development. Okay. And when I say what smart development, mm -hmm. I mean the, the usage of land that we have, good stewardship of the land that we have, preserving what we have, um, not feeling the pressure to develop just because a developer wants to develop, um, and being a sustainable city. In our comprehensive plan book, the first thing, the first page, talks about us being a sustainable city. That is what our vision is. Very first words in our comp plan. 
and I want to see us work more towards that. Green initiatives, okay. right, to not keep developing the same cookie cutter housing that we have. When we talk about having affordable housing, have truly affordable housing here in Deltona, and preserving a good mixture of land between five acre, one acre. If it's not marketable, it doesn't mean that it's not going to be in the future. We're changing, um, but there, there needs to be serious look at how we are doing that. I think that we're on the right path uh, as far as um, parks and rec go. That's what people want during the time of COVID. That's the thing that they could depend on is our park and rec system to go do stuff. I think that we're headed the right way in commercial development. I think we need to put more emphasis on commercial development as Commissioner King spoke uh, and do a better job of being a steward of our property. Uh, you know, in the fact that, listen, they, they, we have development coming in and, and here's what happens. They, it's 20 acres, completely clear cut, just so that they can plant new trees, right? It, and we should have more control over development orders and the way that that looks, the preservation of our natural environment. That's what I'm concerned about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for, I think bottom line, honestly, we all have consensus up here about one thing, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think we're headed in the right direction. Un unfortunately, bottom line is going back to that master planning of land development. Because I think while some of us might want certain things here, we do it based on what's in front of us according to the law. Mm -hmm. So it's not about I don't like this or I like that. It's this is what the law says. Mm -hmm. And I think if at the end of the day, we can work on that, on the land development so we can get some consensus up here. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we're treating everyone fair. And that's all I want. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to have a land development code that we're treating everyone fair, Perfect. not adjusting it mm -hmm. as I feel emotionally about anything. Mm -hmm. And I think to me, that's the bottom line. Okay. All right. I'm going to skip the mayor and vice mayor and come back to y'all. Your priority. Well, I think everybody's already talked about the land development code. I think that's a number one priority we need okay. to address. Two, commercial properties. I think we need to define where our commercial properties are located mm -hmm. and make sure there's proper infrastructure in that location so we can start developing commercial property. Mm -hmm. um, the second um, would, would be, we talked about this, I, I know Herb, you and I have talked about it, um, a, a, some sort of trade school, whether it's a complete public trade school or a private public uh, you know, participation, we need to get something going here because we, we have, if we're going to build commercial, we're going to need folks that can do that. And I'd rather have our folks in Deltona have the skill sets, whether it's HVAC, electrical, plumbing, welding. We need to look at something here in Deltona that offers that. Uh, right now, my son, he has to, I drive him over to Ormond Beach several times a week just so he can go to an engineering academy over there after high school. So if we had something here more locally, I think that would be very beneficial, not just to the high schoolers, but anybody who's already graduated out of high school and they're looking for a skill set because we want to talk about median incomes. Mm -hmm. When we don't have the skill sets there, obviously your pay is going to be down at the bottom level. So if we can help residents of Deltona increase their skill set, bring up that wage, I, I think that would benefit the community as an overall asset. So that is something that I personally would like to see. I know I looked here, I saw on one on uh, page, uh, it's kind of leaked out, looks like 25, you had partnering with, uh, you know, Halifax and Daytona State. Mm -hmm. um, the Halifax, I think that's great for nursing, but we have several other mm -hmm. areas that we need the opportunities mm -hmm. for, and that's something I would like to see the, mm -hmm. the direction of the city go. Just as a quick aside, uh, the governor was in uh, Gainesville earlier this week and announced a new charter school that was would be high school, community college, and a technical skills. Yeah. That's his argument is we're not producing technical skills anymore. And my understanding was that may be rolled out statewide for some reason. Santa Fe Community College got to be first, but really, <laughs> but, oh, uh, I have to look into that one. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Mr. Bradford. I actually have a few, so probably That's a good fine. thing you saved me here towards the end. Okay. I'm going to start at the top. Okay. And I'm going to start at 
I don't think we can throw any more on staff okay. than staff already has okay. until positions are filled. And I'm not talking we're going to hold a job fair and it's going to take months for processes to go through and, and positions to be filled. So I'm still getting word that we have filled positions, but then I'm hearing from Mr. Peters today, this position's not filled, well this position's not filled, and this position's not filled. Okay. So we can sit up here and we can, we can put all these demands on staff, but what good is it gonna be until those positions are filled? It has to be a priority that we get people hired and in that position as soon as we possibly can. Okay. Then you can ask staff for more. Sure. But how do you ask staff for more when they're already understaffed? Okay. That's number one. So I'd like so to the see the staff, the my, morale, the, the leadership, okay. you know, I, I, we've got to get those positions and we've got to get that fixed. Okay. We've had a lot of positions and people leave, so that needs to be addressed and they need to be filled and it needs to be rectified. Um, then I feel we need to have our entryways to the city defined. Okay. It's like if I'm going to go and I have somebody say, hey, go build this for me, what's my first thing? What are you building? Where are we building? How are we doing? It. I can't do anything else unless I have that defined. Okay. I can't even, I don't even see how I can even do a development plan um, without knowing what what are they doing a development plan for mm -hmm. you know what what type of what type of buildings do we want what what type of entryways do we want mm -hmm. you know we're talking about doing villages and if you go through say Mount Dora Mount Dora's one section looks different than this section over here this has got this fill and this has got this fill so we can't do a development plan until we have these areas defined. Okay. And I feel like we're here, 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 and here, and we're not doing things in order. Okay. So I'd like to see things prioritized to, this is gonna be first, then this, then this, then this. Okay. And, and we need to be doing them in order. Okay. So number um, one with you is get staffing. Number one to me is this, staffing and morale is, is critical. Okay. If we don't have our staff in place and, and staff in line, we're not gonna get any of this addressed and done. Okay. Number two is get the, the image or look Let's or get whatever the, it is. the image, the entryways, um, and that that also goes to let's let's once that's defined, in order to do that, as Mr. Peters said, we gotta have community engagement. Mm -hmm. Community engagement, hold community meetings in each district, and every one of our districts is different. My district is totally different than Vice Mayor's district because I'm got a lot of commercial going on it, and she's got a lot of residents. Mm -hmm. So her district needs are gonna be totally different than my district needs. And again, these meetings have to take place and they have to be defined. Um, before we can we can do too much on that. Okay. Um, we discussed this land development code and it's been discussed for years. I'm not gonna lie, this is not a new thing. Um, I've been cued since I've been a commissioner that there's certain parts that haven't been approved and I've asked for clarification on that. So here we're talking about land development code that I don't necessarily know that's ever been approved. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to know that whether it has been and what we are using. Okay. Um, and we were told a year ago that, hey, we're not gonna put this on hold, but we're gonna go through and we're gonna get this fixed and we're working on it in first quarter of 2022. And we are in first quarter 2022 and now I'm told, you know, we're another year down the road. So that's, that's kind of important as well. Um, the community involvement also involves community events, community engagement, um, having, having these little events for the community, they love it. Mm -hmm. Parks and Recs does events in different parks in different areas. Parks and Recs has done an amazing job, and I'm gonna say I think we have the best Parks and Recs department since I've been here that we've ever had. Mm -hmm. they've, they've brought more events, but I still think we can kick it up a notch mm -hmm. and have more events, you know. Um, I'd like to see when I when I say those events, you know, as I went through this real quick, I saw that we're looking at bringing the MLK back. That's great. Um, we talked about having a Memorial Day parade. We talked about our Christmas parade. We talked about a Juneteenth event. So these are community events and community involvement. And I don't necessarily say that, hey, this event has to take place in this district. I like to see them taking place in all these different entryways that we still have to define. Okay. Um, let me see what other note I have. And number, put this kind of high too, is transparency. Okay. Transparency, we, we, we talked about this before John even came. Um, I still think we got a lot of work to do on transparency. And I'll tell you where, when, when I see an agenda and I don't have 
this information that's thrown at me this morning, that's transparency. Okay. That's getting us all the information. And I have people call me and say, hey, did you know? Uh, oh, great, thanks for telling me. Glad you know it before I know it. So that's that's gotta be up there on the list as well. Okay. okay. So. Vice Mayor. Thank you. So I agree with most of everything that was discussed up here by the uh, other commissioners. And uh, one of the things that Commissioner um, mentioned, uh, uh, Bradford mentioned, was about the difference in each district. Mm -hmm. And there is a huge difference in each district. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, one district is older than the other and, and has more residents than, than other districts. My priority would be to let's finish what has been started Let's take care of our infrastructure that needs attention first before we go into anything new because we're just adding new items to something that's crumbling already. Okay. So let's take care of our infrastructures. Okay. Until we get that done, we're not going to have businesses coming into the city of Deltona. Okay. Um, that speaks for my district. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I, I hear all the, the uh, residents um, complaining about no restaurants. Well, we, we're not equipped to have restaurants. Our roads are not equipped mm -hmm. for restaurants. And our main roads actually belong to the county. County. So we need to work together with the county and FDOT and everybody else to get these roads in condition to bring in more restaurants, more businesses, so to speak. Uh, but we first have to take care of our current problems in the city, bring those problems up to par um, so that our city is ready in structure, in roads, sewers, uh, water, even gas pipes you know, ready for new commercial to come in. So um, let's finish projects that we have working now and then jump to step two and then step three because we're going from starting step one and now we're working on step three, but step two hasn't even been addressed. Okay. And that's where I feel we are bombarding our, our, our staff. Okay. They're so confused, they don't know which way to turn. Mm -hmm. You know, we tell them do this and then we say stop that and do that and then stop this and get in the middle. Okay. So we have to concentrate on our priorities. To me, our priority is the current issues that we are addressing in the city right now, roads, um, infrastructure, and all that area. And then everything else can fall into place because we'll be ready for it. Okay. Mayor. Okay, thank you. So everybody's ideas up here have reflected also on, on a lot of the things that I want to say. Um, the first thing that I want to say is um, there's a big correlation between the land development code and all of our other our codes. It, the land development code has been changed and, and updated over time, and it's always been brought to the commission and approved. It's been approved, and the different sections that we, we've done have been approved through the commission that I know of that we voted on. So I think that the land development code and really doing um, a deep dive into that in terms of I don't feel our staff, we can put that, that, that pressure on our staff. It has to be done where we bring an outside organization in to really go ahead and do that. And if we do that, we need to, I should say when we do that, if it's a, if it's a commission priority, it needs to, every section needs to be, the commission needs to be included or at least for an explanation mm -hmm. of how things are done. Because I think that listening to the questions that we had today, like let's just take an example of Rhode Island, I think that there's a confusion Fusion as to what our cost is, what we are capable of in the city, and what the bigger vision is. And I think that those things have to be clarified. And for us, sometimes it, the communication is also what I hear. It needs to be, like, we need to have a visual, like, like for example, what we had today, that we have something to reference. That, um, and which brings me to the communication portion of it. it. We've come far, we still have a lot, a long ways to go. And we have to communicate, there has to be better internal communication between the departments, um, your outside departments, your sheriff's department, your fire department, your center, your, your internal. That has to be a clear definition so that everyone is on the same page. That's a priority is, is communication. And the third thing that's a big priority for me is uh, the budget. 
And I think that we as a commission, that's one of our priorities, that's one of the things that we are tasked with is to bring forth a balanced budget. And I think that we need more of a, a deep dive into what things really cost. And not only that, what are we not doing? What are we not, that's been budgeted, what are we not doing and what have we not done over the years? Because that's why we have, an alleged, we have a surplus, but then once you start doing these things, it's a financial reset. Um, the last thing is don't reinvent the wheel. Don't reinvent the wheel. We just got, thank you, Ron, for bringing the, the, the visuals up that we had when we did this, this plan for the city. Mm -hmm. We, we spent a lot of time and a lot of money. I was part of that years ago, a lot of sessions to, to bring that together with the community. The community did that. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to ordinances, when it comes to uh, uh, things like these plans. Let's look back as to what we have and what we can use from other municipalities where ordinances work, where things work bring it forward to the commission and explain that this is what DeLand uses or Orange City uses. These are what we've already done with, with visioning sessions. This is what we've done. This was our strategic plan. I looked at our old strategic plan. It, it talked about the land development code in 2015, 2016, 2017. You know, what are we not getting done? And to the vice mayor's point, let's clean up what we have. We have deplorable buildings in this city. We have buildings in our park and rec department that are beyond deplorable. Mm -hmm. How do we consider new when we have gems in our community that we either have, we have to make hard decisions, what are we gonna do with them? But it goes back to the land development code. Mm -hmm. When we have a thing like Lakeshore, how do we reinvent that? Not, not going out and doing new things. New things look shiny and great. But for my goal as mayor and as a commissioner and as a resident is to sustain this city, not for the next two, five, ten years, but for the next 50, mm -hmm. and make it a sustainable city that we're all proud to live in and give back to our residents who have chosen to invest here. Okay, mm -hmm. okay y'all said a lot of stuff. Let's uh, try to put it in a, in a package. I'm going to take the easiest stuff first. Y'all are consistently talking about the need to grow businesses in the city, and the consistent gap on that is infrastructure. So I would assume one ongoing priority for the city is to build the infrastructure mm -hmm. on a commercial basis. Can I get nods of acknowledgement or disagreement on that? Yes. We're not commercial one, two, three, four, but we're just saying this is an ongoing priority. My question with doing the infrastructure. Okay is, which I agree, we gotta finish what we started, but if we're going to change what, let's say, my area, which is a lot of county, okay. um, how do we know what infrastructure we're gonna need in place if we haven't defined those entryways? Okay. Like, how do we know okay. over at the first exit, what do we do, what, what's that gonna be? So how do we know what we need to put in there, infrastructure-wise, if we haven't defined it yet? Okay. That's that question. Okay. Um, so I, I don't have a problem with that, but I just think, There's I don't want us to say, I'm gonna send money here doing this, okay. but then we define that entryway and we discover, oh wow, this needs to be changed and moved, and, and had we known what we were gonna do, we would have, cool. now we're ripping it up and redoing it. So I still think we have to define those entryways so that we can adequately put these things in place and, and then let's let's continue on with the right. Okay, all right, okay. So I'll, with that caveat. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll accept that. Another one I, I want to check with you is just the need to have the adequate staffing to do this. Uh, would you see that as a priority or not? Have ad adequate, adequate staffing. staffing. Yeah. To have adequate staffing. To, to do all this stuff, that you've got the staff on board who can do it. Just, just wanted to affirm. Yeah. <laughs> mm. I think we have a great staff. Yeah. Um, I would, before I say we need to hire a bunch of more people, I would, I would defer to our city manager and say, how do we do on the job fair? Don't, didn't we fill a lot of those positions? He reported today that that the person on staff that was taking care of a couple of the issues here that we're looking at 
um, left. Um, I don't know if that was yesterday. I don't know if that was five days ago or five weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to comment on whether or not uh, the person that we need to fill that position, you know, um, left after the job fair or, or anything. So I don't. I can't answer a question like that uh -huh. and 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 say, oh, we need better staffing. I think they're doing a great job with their staffing. I think that if the positions, if the positions aren't filled, that they will be. Um, we have to let the city manager do his job and not sit up here and bombard him because he let us know today that someone okay. uh, left to go someplace else. Okay. Let him do his job, he'll fill the position, and that stuff will be back on track. So, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to jump in on that one without knowing what the numbers are and so on. I think if staffing is important, um, I think we've been pushing for better staffing. So, um, that is not that's his job over there. That's our city manager's job. So a priority for the manager is to tell you, here's the staff I need, or, or to get those staff, and he has a barrier. And, and we have and we have given him direction to get the staff that he needs. Okay. And, and so, all right. and, that's and where I am on that. And, and I agree, Commissioner King, but I also think that for the commission, um, when you look at the reality of staffing right now everywhere, you, you have shortfalls. And I think at some point, the commission needs to also say to the manager, it's okay if you outsource. Okay. If you cannot hire enough people to do the landscaping, outsource. Get a company that you can hold accountable, have them for a year. If you don't like it, you can try to go back out and do something. There has to be an option. Instead of continuing to build staff, mm -hmm. if you're not seeing a, a result or you have a constant turnover, you have to be willing to say, we need to hire an outside firm to do your cleaning, to do your landscaping, to do other things. So I think that option has to be open and Madam for the Mayor, manager. I agree. I, I agree. But the the other the other side of that is that we were outsourcing for a lot of our inspection work, and now we're not. And the department is making money that they weren't making before. And, and, and I and I agree with you job. on that. And so, I agree with you on that, 100%. Okay. But there are so, also things when you when you continue to hire staff, you have to also factor in benefits. You have to factor in retirement. And it depends at which level you're going to do that. And I agree with you. The building inspection interior is much better. Okay. So it's a case by case. Yes. Case where the manager well, needs to make a. Can, can we get an idea of? Like I know the job fair was a success and we had a lot of candidates. How many of those candidates have actually made it through the hiring process? Because I understand that's a tedious process and a time consuming process. So how many actually made it through and you know, are we in a spot we have to hold another one to get positions filled, you know? Because I'm sure some of them didn't make it through. Um, so where are we at actually? I will say that um when we increased the uh, the pay back on October 1, we had a significant number of vacancies at that point. In addition, we had new positions in co-compliance and, and recreation to fill. Uh, we had done an incredible job of filling those positions. The ones that I was referring to earlier are some people who had left the organization and we are just now replacing them. These are vacancies that have occurred in the last five weeks. It takes time to advertise and go through interviews and all that. We have selected two people to replace two people that recently left. Um, and you know, to the communication side, you know, two of the vacancies that we're filling are on the communication side because Ms. Kipolo and I have identified that uh, one of the areas that we really need to emphasize in this city is getting the information out. Um, I, I'm going to do a personal shout out right now, and that is to uh, every one of you all know Rocco. Um, he had been a one man show for about two months now, and he's done an incredible job during those two months. Uh, but he has shown some of the things that we can do from a communication standpoint. 
Y'all will be amazed to know how much better we've been doing in the last two months with one man. No, Is Mr. Lopez not here anymore? Pardon me? Lee Lopez, he's still here, correct? Still here. Uh, he was out on medical leave during that part of that time. Lee's back. Um, but, you know, we're going to get a full staff, but if we can model ourselves after how we've done the last two months, you're going to see a vast improvement on the uh, communication side. We have two new hires, uh, hopefully they, they follow through and come here, um, that are amazing individuals. Um, we're extremely excited about the future of our public information office in terms of the things that we'll be able to achieve in the future. Um, one of them um, has an incredible experience in events, uh, so we'll be able to tap in on that. But um, you know, from the stamp, the one area that uh, we are having some problems is in the fire department. And part of that, and the chief and I have, the chief had come forward with a strategy. Uh, in the past, what we would, we required you know, that they be fire and paramedic. In the past, what we have done is hire fire and then get them to paramedic. Well, it's actually more efficient to hire people with paramedics than get them to fire. So we're shifting our thing. I just signed off on a bunch of new hires for the fire department um, by making that shift. So we're constantly looking at ways to fill in the gaps, look at new ways of doing it. And I applaud my staff for coming through with uh, some innovative ways, uh, much like the chief did, with changing how we hire our fire department personnel. Um, you know, we are doing our level best. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's interesting, uh, you know, people have vacancies and they're saying that we, you know, the United States has hired more people, so that means it's probably less people that be hired. Um, but um, I just want to say that since October to now, we have done an incredible job of filling. Part of that is y'all's uh, willingness to go with the, the minimum $15. That's made a huge difference. The number of people that we get apply for positions, it's significantly more. Okay, so, let, let me ask my you. question another way, because I appreciate all the information. I get the increased pay, I get the new positions, blah, blah. The positions that we had come to the job fair and the open positions we've had, are those positions filled? Are the open positions filled and how many more do we have to fill? I'm talking parks, I wasn't even thinking fire, I'm talking fire, parks, our building department, our admin, how many of those positions are still open? John, would you um, I don't have an exact number, yeah. but well, it's can you, not can a you very Can you just get it? Number. That's what I'm saying. I know you're not going to have it right now, but I'd just like to have, like, I'll get that information. where are we at? I'll okay. get it. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to piggyback on that. Um, you know, transparency and communication. I, I, I think um, what Public Works does, we get that dashboard. Mm -hmm. You know, a monthly dashboard, it tells us how many full-time, part-time, how many vacancies, what their turnover is, what their projects are, where's the status on that. I think that dashboard, most of the department should use that dashboard to kind of give everybody an idea. So, you know, that information is fairly read, readily available to everybody. You know, we can look at it, we can say, okay, parks, we got 20 positions, we got three out, we got to fill those. They're doing X, Y, and Z this week. You know, we, we, we've got public works are okay. going to be doing X, Y, and Z this week. We got three people here, fire department, we've got three openings. I, I think those dashboards are very beneficial because I can look at it and I kind of know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not only just for staffing and that, but like with future projects for, you know, when we're getting somebody, say somebody comes in and they want to build an RPDU in this area, you know, basically um, have it to where, you know, because sometimes I get calls and it's like, no, I haven't heard that year, and then I find out, yeah, it's actually happening. So, I, I like for development, maybe an application process has been in and, you know, where we're at in the status of all that so that everybody knows so nobody's caught off guard. So, a expansion of an existing tool, our dashboard, yes. is citywide. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, I got three more topics I want to talk with you about. One is that transparency budget. But I want to turn to the land development code now. You're raising the, the core quandary issue. Do we have to have something envisioned before we develop this land development code? What's the sequence? So I'm going to ask both the manager and the attorney to chime in. And Ron, if you'll come up so you can chime in also. I am not an expert in land development code, so, but these people do. So I want to talk about, because, you know, this is critical for all the things you want, it's, you got to have a legal basis in your land development code. And Commissioner Ramos is right. If you don't have it there, other factors overwhelm you. And you have to prove things you don't like because they have a legal right. So this is really, from what y'all have talked to me about, the direction of this city, this is a starting point. Uh, so, and, Ron, if I may start with Ron here. Okay. Development of a land development code, just typically how long does it take a city to do that if you've got an existing one? Typically to do a thorough job, depending on the vision and so forth, probably at least two years. Okay. All right. And is that usually an outsourced function? Most of it yeah, it's usually a combination of, of the use of consultants and, you know, a lot of effort on the part of staff as well. Okay. All right. Okay. So one, we've got to make sure we've got enough internal staffing to be able to take it on with everything else they got to do. And two, there's going to be some external cost to this thing. A absolutely. Okay. All right. I'd like you to comment. John made earlier the, the question of, of the level of detail in the land development code and use the example of some city where it's almost every parcel has its own land development code, which you're certainly not going to go to. The question is, do you really need different land development codes for these villages? Or is there an alternative where you don't have to have that and you can approach it another way to address the, the valid issues the commissioner is raising of how do we start a code without some vision of what it is we want? So, Herb, if I could jump in real quick on that. Sure. Um, one of the problems, and Ron and I talked about it just a little bit ago, at the last time we did a comprehensive plan here was in 2010, Ron, 2011? Uh, the latest update to the city's comprehensive plan was completed in 2018. And we're coming up on the next revision cycle known right. as the evaluation and appraisal report. So quite often we got to do the comprehensive plan in concert with the land development code. Okay. And that's your current situation now, John? <coughs> both, both tracks? Okay. All right. Okay. Let me go back to that question. Can, can you create a, a citywide land development code that allows you other tools such as overlay districts to address the concerns Commissioner Bradford's raising or, or not? Or any any local like government would have that option to, to look at that, and that is, you know, part and parcel to the vision. Yeah, I think you're, we're having a hard time hearing you, Herb. Hearing me? Yeah. yeah. Maybe the mic up a little. No, because she, I'm, I'm just wearing out, you know. That's better. <laughs> I thought okay. she was talking about not being able to hear me. Usually my voice projects pretty well. <laughs> I, I asked Ron, is given your very legitimate question, you know, do we need divisions in place before it, is can you do a citywide land development code and then use other tools such as overlay districts to adapt it? And I'd, I'd just like to know that. <laughs> okay. They can hear you evidently, so go. Okay. Yeah, it, a lot of it the, really is underpinned by the vision of the city. You know, what direction does it go, want to go in? What is the expectation articulated? That should ideally happen in the context of, you know, a robust public scoping process. You know, ask, you know, the, the citizens, what do they, is their expectation? What do they want to see? And, you know, ideally that would happen during the evaluation and appraisal report, you know, updating the comprehensive plan since all the city's land development regulations are really an implementation of your all's comprehensive plan. So could I just make a quick comment? So when the city was developed, and if you look at the, when, when, the city, when Deltona became a city, there seemed to have been at that time a priority to make the city of Deltona mostly residential. And you can see that by how the growth was set up and, and how the, the city became residential, and there was a huge push for rooftops. 
the years, and especially under this commission and even today's comments, there seems to be a shift toward the desire to have a more commercial growth and not make this the city of a subdivision of rooftops, but to make it a viable commercial shift. That's what I, I'm hearing here. So using that, that as part of the land development code, I think that's important when you look back at how Deltona was set up and how the first 10 years were of strict residential growth. So it's as a retirement community, and now you have a totally different setup. So I think that looking at the shift that we have and what you're hearing from the commission, you, you still want to have residential, but you also want to have a big commercial shift okay. and a priority toward commercial is what I hear up here. <clears throat> and a lesser, lesser development of the residential parcels that are still vacant for that. Okay. If that makes a difference. Is that a fair reading of the commission? Would you all agree with the mayor? Okay. No. I mean, that, that's what I've heard. Okay. That, you, that I mean, there's I definitely, some, I see some different you don't think so, so Commissioner yeah. Bradford? I, I, think, I think what we're saying is, I agree, yes, the commercial, mm -hmm. but like Vice Mayor said, every district's different. So to throw and say, okay, over here, we're gonna do a whole bunch of commercial when it's dominant residential, you're gonna have a lot of upset residential customers. Mm -hmm. So again, we go back to, as Ron said, defining, I think it's gotta have that, that balance, I think we have to define these entries ways so staff knows what's what and what's going where. You know, do I say it needs to be all single family homes? No, we need that mixture. We need those apartments, those condos, and that that's all going to depend on what goes where. Well, and if I'm not mistaken, Ron, it wasn't the land development that that's not approved, it's the um, urban design pattern book was never approved, correct? That, that's correct. Uh, the copies that you all were provided with here just a few minutes ago do cite uh, an August 4th, 08 adoption date. Uh, that was an aspirational uh, date and I checked the, the the city's records there was no ordinance or resolution that that facilitated the adoption of that so so where does that come in when we're on this land development code where does that come into the land development code is that to be a, a part of it or is that in addition to it, it can be I think you know just to maybe frame everything from what I've, you know, heard and, and, and have been hearing about this matter of, of growth and, and whatnot is we're looking at, you know, where this growth should go, okay? And the pattern book, a lot of it is like, well, what should this growth look like mm -hmm. when it gets here? And I think, I think, you know, there, there, the, your land development code and your zoning and so forth can answer both of those questions, depending on again the extent and the vision for for the community. Um, <clears throat> Just, you know, a little bit of a history lesson with regard to the pattern book and so forth. Again, you know, a lot of very optimistic and it was very sweeping. It was, it was, it was quite visionary at the time, but again, the timing came and the Great Recession came and then, you know, those, those plans were not really ever fully implemented, if at all. And it was just the, 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 the part of the times, you know, the, the priority shifted. Um, I kind of, I ho hopefully that kind of, you know, frames this, this discussion we're having. Again, it's where's this growth gonna go? And what's it look like? Okay. So let's stay with that because what I've heard <coughs> several of you, and believe it or not, y'all aren't the only community of as far as upset about 40 foot wide lots. Everywhere I go, people are upset about 40 foot wide lots. So, because uh, it's so different, you know. Uh, 
and concentrated. So as addressing where and what, the whole question of 40 foot lots can be addressed or what? And I also know this is a legal issue here in terms of land rights, so I'll invite the attorney to weigh in. <coughs> I'd, like, I'd like to get to what, you know, is a very concrete thing that I've heard a lot of concern about in terms of the shape of the community, so. Uh, any commissioners want to go in before that? Commissioner McCool. Questions? Yes. Um, I, I, in talking about this, provided diversity, housing choices, um, you know, the existing comprehensive land book that we have right now is it breaks it down into low density, medium density, high density, commercial, industrial, recreation, and conservation, okay? Agriculture, public, mixed use. I get that, you know, but the the vision that we had that is stated in our comprehensive land is not, in my eyes, not followed. Mm -hmm. We are changing zoning all of the time, which by not following the zoning that is in here, mm -hmm. we have five, maybe four now RE1s left in the city, right? And slow, we do. And slowly, we're eating those up. We, I understand that we have to do by law what we have to do, right? But there, the law protects us as a body. When we make these decisions, it's not automatic that a developer could come in here and change zoning on a property just because that's what they want to do. The law protects us, but so far, or before we thought that that was the case, that we have to say yes to zoning changes. Okay. So when I'm talking about the comprehensive plan and the diversity of housing choices, mm -hmm. we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. We're slowly eating up. We have no or little agriculture. I understand that it's used for a placeholder, right? But we're not planning that. Developers coming in, oh, we want to use this property and it's done. So when we talk about when we talk about in our comprehensive plan, you know, the first thing it says on our, our first policy, FL 1.12, I'm not trying to beat this, but I'm trying to clarify, provide a balance of residential and non-residential land uses that offer opportunity to live, work, and play within the city boundaries, particularly in compact mixed use developments, which we don't have a lot of. Okay, regulate the subdivision of land. So when we're changing a zoning law, when we vote to do that, we are in essence not regulating the subdivision of land. It's being chopped up into smaller properties. So my concern with the vision and goal is that when we talk about the diversity of housing choices, we have old stock that we could be rehabbing, like you said, using the shiny new instead of fixing what we have. And I think some emphasis needs to be placed on that also. So how do we continue to move forward? Ron, how many people does will the city of Deltona hold? It has been a while since we've done a vacant land analysis. And again, it's just based on several parameters there could be an assumption that every all of our vacant land resources develop at a density of 12 units per acre, or are they developed at a density of three units per acre? It yet to be determined. I mean, our carrying capacity, also the wild cards, this is something we haven't done a lot of, which is annexation. Yep. You know, we're, we're, we can make an assumption that the boundaries of the city are gonna stay static, even though our options for annexation are very, very low. But the, you know, it depends how we use our land resources. I think, you know, we can, we can make the, the assumption with some degree of confidence that the continued development pattern in the city and the residential arenas kind of probably be detached dwellings on individual lots, the size of those lots being debatable. And, you know, okay, look at the census data, it's 2.99 people per household. Uh, you know, how many acres of land do we have? Uh, divide that by 
X number of units per acre, multiply it by three people per dwelling unit. And that's kind of, you know, a very, very 30,000 foot view of a vacant land analysis. Well, and if I could jump in. Yes, sir. Um, that particular analysis was done as part of our uh, consumptive use permit. Um, and it was a fairly low density that was utilized. And that's why we have a consumptive use permit and anticipates a population of 125,000 people. So, that, so that's, that's kind of, but let me, let me also finish something here. Um, as the mayor alluded to a, a little bit ago, um, this city was developed, was envisioned as a residential community. To a person, every single one of you all talk about the desire for commercial development. I have spent 42 years of my career in local government with a strong emphasis in economic development. There are certain things that you learn over the year. For instance, you need 13,000 people for every grocery store. So the windows they see out there are in Cortland and Doyle failed because there weren't 13,000 people around. They were anticipating future growth. Didn't happen. They went under. Commercial tends to go around grocery stores. And so if we want commercial development, we need land, we need utilities, and we need 13,000 people for that grocery store to start the commercial district. Mm -hmm. We had a grocery store on Deltona Boulevard that went under. It's mm -hmm. now family health store. It's never been replaced. Yep. And that commercial corridor had struggled. Not the least of which is not utility, but that shopping center has sewer. Um, and so there are a lot of factors that go into this whole thing. If we have continually said, we imagine we develop, we discover Deltona. That goes to our whole land development code, our whole process. Yeah, we all want commercial. This gentleman up here mentioned, Mr. Sosa, I'm sorry, uh, mentioned the desire to have people with livable skills to work. Guess what we don't have in Deltona until just recently? Manufacturing industrial, but people with the skill set that will make sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 can work. It's not here in Deltona. That's part of what the activity center, the desire to do Rhode Island, some of that may be able to be done. But we have got to reimagine and redevelop our whole comp plan and land development code based on that. We have invested a lot of money for sewer plants, and we have the highest sewer rates. You know why we have the highest sewer rates? It's because normally you don't build your second plant until you're 80% capacity. Right now, given the capacity that we're using at Eastern and Fisher, we should just now be planning to build Eastern. But no, whoever was on commission at the time believed that we were gonna see this incredible growth that the recession destroyed. We invested into a second plant earlier than we probably should have. We put debt on it. We've been paying debt for 12, 14 years on the Eastern plant that should just now be under design and construction. You know, my public work background is speaking up here because you know, we, it, it's hard when you got the highest sewer rates around and we have adequate capacity for growth. And I appreciate everyone concerned about the impact of higher density growth. But it's that higher density growth that was anticipated when they built the new plant. So, you know, we have got to take a comp I, I appreciate everything being said, but we have got to open up and take a comprehensive look at everything. If you want commercial, 
I can tell you right now, I need this to support that commercial. Mm -hmm. And if you're not willing to do this, then don't talk to me about commercial. The only reason we're getting commercial development in the Deltona Village is because the demographics are getting pulled in from Victoria Hills, not Deltona. That's why they're going there. But if you get further into Deltona, the demographic gets worse. Certain businesses want an average income of $60,000. Deltona is at 54, 55 now. It's much better than it used to be, but it's not 60. And these companies have hard, fast rules. And when you move into the interior of Deltona, that number comes down. So, you know, I appreciate everything being said. That's why we have got to get you information so you understand that, for instance, you need 13,000 people for a grocery store. Very basic. Uh, and that starts your commercial stuff, so I'll stop and say. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for that clarification, because I think that's what we need to hear. Vice Mayor, and then I have a I, comment. I wasn't done. I'm sorry, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Oh, are you done? No, no, I was not done. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Peters, for that, because I need to hear that, as does the public, okay? Because we are ineffectual at times of explaining that to the public. What we cannot prevent people is growth. Can't prevent it, it's going to happen, landowners have rights. What we, however, can do is demand better out of this growth is demand that we take a closer look at protected lands and we don't, listen, we don't have to approve every rezoning that comes across our way because of legal reasons. We have qualified legal staff to, to discuss concerns with. And I understand that we go by what is on our books. What I'm saying is because we have to follow the law and we have to do that, we only have so much more land to develop if we're going to get a grip on that. It's a nasty circle. We can't do this because of that. Because of the laws that we have, they don't protect us. So how do we protect ourselves? Well, the only thing that we have is subjectivity, how we interpret what is right for us, and what is right change in that zoning law. I understand that. And there has been innovative things we talk about in our comp plan that we must have innovative building and we've not done a good job of that. We've not done a good job with our development orders saying that, hey, we would like to see greener initiatives. We would like to see this used. We've, and so how do we protect ourselves? It's almost like we can't protect ourselves. In order to do that, we would have to ask for a time certain moratorium on any rezoning because we know that the development is going to happen, but we have to stop for a moment to require that we have better standards for that. That's what I'm getting to. I want you to come to Deltona and develop, but I want you to understand what the expectation is as far as development goes. We, as far as greener building products, as far as design. So how do we stop the merry-go-round and do that? We only have so much more to develop. That, that's all I'm saying. I, I want developers here. I want good developers here. I want to see beautiful homes in Deltona. I don't mind 40-foot lots as long as they are done in a green manner, but we're not doing that. They, you can't have your cake and eat it too. At some point, we have to stop the merry-go-round until we get what it is we're asking for. That's all I'm saying. I don't want to stop development. I would like to halt it until we get our stuff together. That's it. Thank you, ma'am. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, before Mr. Peter uh, came on, I was um, going to touch on the same subject, the same comments that he made. Mm -hmm. Having uh, been out there soliciting businesses mm -hmm. or whatever to come to the city of Deltona, I have been told, we can't come to your city because we don't have the number of, re of co customers mm -hmm. to, so, to keep us in business, right? And so I wanted to know, how do you identify that? How do you know that? And Ron, correct me if I'm wrong, but they literally click incoming traffic and outgoing traffic. 
That's what I was that told is, by one of the businesses. Way, yes. They literally sit, have someone on each entrance of the city, and they click incoming and outgoing mm -hmm. traffic. And there's more outgoing traffic <laughs> than incoming traffic. So to them, that's not a business place, mm -hmm. right? So. You know, this goes back to, and, and we find ourselves in, 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 in a position that we want to satisfy those people, the residents, who don't want new development, but we also want to satisfy the ones that want businesses to come into the city. And if we don't give the businesses this, we can't get that. So, you know, we find ourselves in the middle and trying to do the best possible for the residents in the city of Deltona. Thank you. Well said. That's actually the position you're in a lot mm -hmm. of time. Right it is. In the middle. <laughs> so la last comment. Um, when we're talking about we're talking about development and we're talking about commercial and we're talking about a developer coming in and asking for a zoning change and saying, okay, um, to Commissioner McCool's comment, we only have X amount of RE1 rural estate zone, mm -hmm. uh, one acre or two acre lots. Oh, um, as as city officials, you have to know that as times change, and we've had that talking about what you just talked about with our, our little books that we have here, as recessions come and go, as booms come and go, we have to adjust, adjust for that. <clears throat> and when you're talking about developer requirements, when you have a development go in, you're talking about buffers, you're talking about green, I agree there's more that we could do. We could definitely ask for more. The city, as a city, over the years has never asked enough, especially from commercial development in terms of road improvements, in terms of, you know, let's put in some mass arm traffic lights. Let's, let's ask for these things that other cities ask for to upgrade that type of infrastructure. But I would also present to you what we have another issue of here, we want to hold developers that want to put in, let's say, 200 houses on 40-foot lots, we want to hold them accountable. We want to have a buffer system when we have commercial development and we want to say, you know, put up a wall, put up, you know, like like in your district and, and do these things and in, in your district by uh, the Walmart. But we also have to consider, if you're talking about true green building and true saving your, your environment, what do we do with standards for infill lots where they come in and they wipe out everything? What do we talk about for RE1? You can talk about having a 20-acre RE1 and you can have 21-acre houses. And what is your standard when they come in and they wipe out every single tree on that house? What is the difference between having a development there where you're putting 50 houses in and you're saving a buffer as opposed to having 21 acre houses that wipe out every single tree. So I mean you have to you have to look at all of your standards. You can't say I don't want development because I want a developer to be held accountable. What are we what are we doing for our city lots in the individual lots as a whole? And what can we do with constraints of the law simply because we have issues with trees, the tree ordinance, which is looking to be adjusted now in Tallahassee, keep your fingers crossed, you're working on that. <coughs> but those are also things that you have to look at okay. from the city where we have so many infill lots and we have a lot of problems with water and everything yeah. there too, Commissioner McCool, right? So, I mean, to me, a parcel of land that's wiped out with 20 houses and not a tree left mm. is the same as a developer coming in and putting in and, and clearing. Oh, okay. So you got to have standards for both if you're looking at really changing the vision of this city, okay. for me. All right, so, so John, I'd, John, I'd like to go to you. You've heard this discussion now. How do you plan to respond to that? <laughs> Oh, would would, out the door would, would you like a five-minute break, sir? How much am I paying you to tell me that? <laughs> um, no, obviously, um, Ron and I will get together with uh, Stacy and other staff members, and we will uh, put together a budget for uh, the uh, land development code process. We will outline a process. We will come back to you all in a workshop format and discuss it. Um, it, you know, we didn't get to go over it, but we had this sheet with regard to the early budget stuff, and I would just caution you that I have not reviewed this information yet. I've reviewed parts of it, but this is 
stuff that came into finance, I haven't gone through my budget review process with directors and all. But you know, the concern is that our undesignated fund balance will go down significantly as it is right now. Uh, so, you know, a two year uh, land development code process, I would imagine, Ron, is probably a half a million to six hundred thousand dollars for a consultant, and um, and to do it right the way we need to do, it, probably going to be more like seven hundred to seven fifty, because I do believe, because of the reimagining, redeveloping. You know, we need to give you information so you understand that in order to get the commercial development, we need blank number of residential. Now, one thing to remember is a lot of this new development that's occurring, it's actually raising our median income because there's not a whole lot of people that can afford three hundred and fifty, four hundred thousand dollar houses that are being built. Uh, so, you know, it's. Uh, on the one hand, the environmentalist in me you know, understands it. On the other hand, the city manager in me that looking at city finances understands the other side. And there's, there's a marriage in between. Um, and I think, you know, the first thing we got to do is visit our future land use map, uh, see if it's appropriate, uh, what needs to be modified. That part of the comp plan process. Am I correct, Ron? Yes, sir. And so, you know, that's why I brought up the comp plan is, you know, one of the problems we have is we have a future land use that is based on 27 years ago, vision of the city. Mm -hmm. We need to have a 2022 vision of what Deltona should be. And that should drive the future land use map. That future land use map then drives the land development code. <coughs> Um, you know, I have no doubt that we have talented people that can put together an extremely good land development code that protects the environment, um, you know, and things of that nature, yet provide the other things that our residents want, such as commercial and other things. So, Anywhere from a half a million to seven fifty. Commissioner King, you had a question, I believe. Ma'am, Commissioner, there's a whole list. Commissioner oh. King is first. I have a couple of comments. I think the first comment is, I hate comparing apples and oranges. Uh huh. Developer comes in and they clear the land. We get that. Just go down to Cortland and Doyle uh, uh, and you'll see it. Um, most people who have 20 acres of land, even if they subdivide it into one acre lots, they don't clear the land. They love the trees. And they keep a lot of those trees on the property. It's not the same. So I just want to make that, from my opinion, from my view, being a person who has a piece of property, I have trees. My wife says it's not enough. I've cleared too much, but I have trees, number one. Um, we have a population of about 94,000 people. We have currently six grocery stores, not talking about specialty stores, I'm talking about grocery stores. That's 15.6 thousand people per store. So we're already above the 13,000. If we add another 6,000 people for the 2,000 homes that we've now uh, approved, uh, we can raise that to um, 16,000 per store. <laughs> so we are getting the people. The people are coming. So we shouldn't be held back by the fact that we don't have enough people in the city. And Ron will tell us next Monday night, or the Monday night after this one, coming, that we have to prepare 
for the people who are going to move in 10 years from now. So we've got houses coming in and we've got people coming in. We've already heard today that we've modified documents. How many times? 17 times we've modified some of the documents. My question is, why can't we have a consensus up here to modify that portion of these documents now that we need to deal with and then we can go through the two-year process, which in my opinion should have been started three and a half years ago, which would have been done by now, by the way, but nobody was listening back then. Why can't we modify those areas that we need to modify now? Why can't we change what low density is? Why can't we say what medium density and high density is? Why can't we do that now? However, we have to do it legally and get that done in a workshop quickly. Let's do what we need to do. Let's bring it to the commission and let's fix that part. And then let's go through the process of making all of this work. Why can't we do that? Ron, you want me to type this one? Sure. <laughs> um, part of the problem goes back to what I just said a few minutes ago. We have a future land use map <coughs> that it makes it very difficult for us to, as I said earlier, take what we call low density and divide it into three different districts. Um, we would have to do a future land use map change because we could, in fact, take what is now low density and divide it into three different districts, but they're not compatible with what our future land use map shows. Is that correct, Ron? Well, you can say no. Well, I think we've got a situation here where we've got, you know, zero to six dwelling units per acre in the low density residential land use designation. We have several zonings that can be applied within that designation that range anywhere from a five acre lot to a 7,500 square foot lot. And perhaps I think there's, in some cases, down to 5,000 square feet. <clears throat> Zoning is, is a way of which for a local government to further define what happens within that parameter. I'm not going to delve into this with any detail, but I think, you know, we need to give some serious, just, just be aware that there are some legal matters that, that come into play here when the city looks at, you know, modifying the, the, density entitlement on a piece of property. You know, we have the ability to do stuff from a planning standpoint, no doubt. We have tools. But I think, you know, it, it's something that any local government needs to be aware of and appropriately balanced. I don't mean to kind of muddy the waters or anything on this, but like I said, it's just something that we need to be aware of. <clears throat> So in essence, there's a series of steps that just have to be taken to protect the city. Yeah, we do have tools and abilities to better define and better manage what happens on the land. There's no doubt about it. But I think we we also do have short. Uh, we, we we our abilities are are limited. Is it is it easier to modify the map than it is to modify the plan? the plan and the map kind of go together. <clears throat> so basically, are you talking about the changes that, that are being discussed? <clears throat> the underlying landowner, would they have to agree to that? Do we do that internally? Is there a chance of a lawsuit? I mean, when we say you have a piece of property that is listed as low density residential, and now we want to change that instead of zero to five, now we're going to say it's from zero to two. 
and the previous and the landowner what is what are the landowners rights for that and what are we looking at if anything yeah I'm I'm gonna defer to the city attorney on that but again I, I just I think it's something that we need to just it, it's a yellow light for some of this stuff <clears throat> Mr. Fowler, Mr. any comments? Yeah, Mayor, I guess the answer to your question is yes, you can do that if you have sufficient justification for doing it because the landowner may or may not like it. Uh, some of the things you've been talking about here, uh, seeking commercial development, etc., maybe the change you make is from two units per acre to 12 or 20 so that you get some uh, um, uh, apartment or condominiums. So it depends on the change and the justification for the change, which is why Mr. Peters was talking about the study, which could, could act and, and serve as a justification for a modification to your future land use plan, so that when that landowner takes exception to it, we have a basis for defending the decision. Commissioner King or Commissioner McCool, did you want to ask, talk about that? Because I, I did. When we talk about density entitlements, right, my concern is that while we have legal boundaries to follow, I understand that perfectly, especially as it has to do with quasi-judicial when we talk about development. As it stands right now, our future land use map is being assailed with multiple zoning changing requests. Legally, if the city finds a reason not to allow a zoning change, we are well within our legal rights not to do so, even at the matter of the character of an area being subjective. I, I ask you, if you take that one matter, the subjectivity, right, and the legalities of the character of an area to court, right, there's really no legal boundaries because it's subjective to what the interpretation of the person that's pushing the narrative is. Like anything, you can narrate a report, you can narrate what you believe to be character of an area, and I only bring that up as a matter of what do you, what do we find important? To me, it is seeing four existing RE1s left in our city, to develop at any given time, and I understand we're trying to pack a bunch of people in for the reasons that we need to support ourselves. I understand that. There's also the matter of sustainability, and we have the right to say, because of our, our future land use map says, that's designated RE1. We haven't changed the map, so why are we having to change the zoning? Legally, we should not have to. Standing on our ground that that is designated already a zoned, there's no legal bullying that would say we have to change a zoning just because a developer wants to change the zoning. It's about what we can legally do. We don't have to change it. You have the property. We're not telling you you can't develop your property as is, but our vision is that it stays RE1, so therefore we don't have to change it legally. I just want that narrative to be straightened out. What we get hit with that all the time, oh, legally we could be sued, legally we could be sued. If we have an exception to what we believe, but we can't get there, you know why? Because we don't have change in our FLU on, in our map. So therefore, we're back to here, provide a diversity of housing choices in the city. I understand what we're trying to do, but legally, I am asking if I find an exception and don't want to approve a change for that zoning reason, I have the legal ability to say, no, it doesn't fit the character of the area or this. That's still an argument. That's what I'm trying to clarify. Mr. Attorney, would you want to respond to that day or would you prefer to have some further time to reflect on and have a more in-depth conversation? Yeah, well, Commissioner, you, the, the answer is certainly you can say no, um, but if, if the other side disagrees with your rationale and challenges it, 
then it's up to a court to decide whether your decision was appropriate. If you go back far enough, the uh, density in this part of the world was pretty low. And if the people at that time had said no, I guess we wouldn't be sitting here today. So the fact that it, it may provide something today doesn't necessarily mean it's, it can be justified tomorrow or even this afternoon for that matter of fact. So you have to be careful in, in how you look at these things. You talked earlier about protecting trees. Adopt a tree ordinance that prevents trees from being removed if they're over two inches in diameter, whatever. But the, the, the ultimate answer to your question is what is appropriate for that property at this point in time and for the foreseeable future. I don't know if you noticed in the paper, but they're having a big problem down in Seminole County with one developer who wants to go in and he's challenged it and he's lost. So if your justification for saying no is adequate and sufficient, then you can prevail and you can say no. And part of that, I again, and this is the last thing I'm gonna say about this, okay? Part of that, Part of the interpretation, and you know this in the legal field, interpretation is everything. There's law, but there's also subject to interpretation. And it's about what as a community or what as a dais or what as a board we, we interpret that as. We, if I say that's designated RE1, we haven't spent enough time, we don't think it's important enough that we've moved it up, so we've not changed our land use code for that area, then I'm well within my rights to say, nope, so let it be written, so let it be done. And I am within my legal rights to say that. And I just, that's what I'm trying to, Ms. that's what I'm trying to bring up. Ms. McCool, if I can jump in real sure. quick. Um, I would advise you to go back and watch the uh, quasi-judicial training from a year ago. Um, the, the one thing you're saying that concerns me is um, in that quasi-judicial training and Ron has changed his staff report based on that training, where we give you options and reasoning to approve or deny. You all are judges. You can't insert your opinion. You have to base it on competent professional evidence that was provided at the hearing. So when you say, you know, you may not, you have to have somebody provide that evidence that shows that that is the underlying and what have you to follow what staff has given you. So. My, I, I'm just advising, you know, you do have to have competent professional evidence to base your decision. I, and I understand that, Mr. Peters. I, I've been, I have been subject to teaching on that quite a bit as that comes down. And there is something to be said also for bringing legacy knowledge to those quasi-judicial hearings. That counts for something also. Bringing that knowledge of these past cases. So all I'm saying, sir, is that we are presented information and, and we have, we, we are well within our rights to make decisions based on that. That's what I'm Madam saying. Mayor, if I may, we have two other topics I'll raise. I know, and you've got like six people on the board. Okay. So um, how do you want to handle it? Because I have Commissioner Ramos, Bradford, Sosa, McCool, and the Vice Mayor. Okay. Uh, well, I have, a, I'm assuming I have a new deadline. Uh, so I'm trying to stick with that. I do need at least 10 minutes on budget. Okay, uh, so Commissioner uh, Ramos, we Bradford, Sosa. See if we need to. Okay, but, uh, what do you guys want to talk about real quick? Um, Commissioner Ramos is first, then Bradford, Sosa, and then you. You're good? Okay. okay. Um, I wanted Ron to finish because uh, um, he's actually brought some questions up that I have on our priorities and from what Ron's telling us is, and, and Ron, that's why I want you to go through it. So from what I'm hearing is we got to have the community development and our community meetings and, and define entryways and, and where John kind of threw something else in there was... <clears throat> we know our future land use. So it's like, do we have to have the future land use figured out before we can do the entryways? And then you've got the urban design book and we've got the land development and then we got planning. So I, I would like to know, in your opinion, 
where do we start? I don't want to know what you think we want to hear. I want to know on your side, planning and development, what is our next step and then the next step and the next step and the next step so we can actually give adequate direction because my head's spinning. The logical order of events, in my opinion, is to start this dialogue as part of the evaluation and appraisal report. And especially the public scoping element of that process. And that will lead to amendments to your all's comprehensive plan, including looking at the future land use map and that will establish provisions to move this city forward for the next seven years and it will provide guidance for amending and updating the city's land development code. And it also provides a legal underpinning for those changes to the land development code. Since your land development code is your impl an implementing document of the comprehensive plan. <clears throat> Thank you. Good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Changes my priorities. Okay. Commissioner Ramos. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to go back when we were talking about developments and their rights and how we're working with them real quickly. Mr. Peters, I know we've had conversation in reference where, and I'm not sure how much of this is being implemented or not, when a developer comes in to speak, that depending on what they're willing to do or not to do, in, in reference to their density, there are certain, can you just explain a little bit about that in reference? Is it something that we're currently doing? Is it something that we're working on doing? Because I think that might help to clarify some of the, the conversation that we're having here. Yeah, you want me to take it? Or whomever. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> We, when a property comes in for a rezoning, probably there's several things that get reviewed. Probably first and foremost is the character of that property. Is it suitable to support the level of development proposed? Put simply, if it's wetlands or a majority wetlands, well, this, that's going to drive the density and the suitability is going to be very questionable at best, okay? It's not to suggest that a property with wetlands on it can't be developed. The other thing is, is infrastructure. Is there water and sewer available? Are there roadways available? It comes back to what kind of is the, the three C's of growth management. Compatibility, which is another thing. Uh, consistency with the comp plan and concurrency. It, concurrency refers to do we have the infrastructure? Compatibility refers to is it compatible with the neighborhood? We don't want to put an industrial use on a piece of property in the middle of a neighborhood, okay? That's kind of an extreme example, but probably the most easy to, to understand and visualize. And is it consistent with the local government's comprehensive plan provisions? So that, that was kind of what we look at when an applicant comes to staff and says, hey, look, I want to do X here. And, you know, looking back to that consistency thing and policy and vision, are we looking for more housing choices? Do we want lower densities? Do we want more density? Do we want more commercial development? Is this property potentially eligible for conversion to commercial based on the fact that it's at an intersection of, a, of two major thoroughfares within the local government? Those are just kind of, you know, some of the parameters that are initially reviewed. You know, when it's, you know, I'm innocently sitting at my desk and the phone rings 
and somebody calls up, hey, I want to do X, Y, Z on parcel A, B, C. And those are just kind of some of the things that we look at. It's like, oh, you, uh, okay, well, all the uses around this thing, this particular piece of property, are residential. So it would probably be compatible to do more residential on that particular piece of property. Another example is, okay, maybe it sits at the intersection of two roads and it's a large enough piece of property, maybe it's compatible or, or appropriate to look at that property being converted to commercial. You know, some sort of neighborhood service type of use. And like I said, those are just some, you know, the very basic parameters that are looked at. Does, does, that, does that answer your question, sir? Yes, but I think in conversation with Peters, my understanding is depending on what a developer is willing or not willing to do, they would be able to get certain credits or whatnot. And I think that's the question that I'm asking in reference to the conversations that we've had. Oh, I, I think I can elaborate upon okay, that. That's fine. A, a good example is a typical cluster type subdivision. You, have, you look at a property holistically and a certain percentage of its wetlands. Those wetlands are preserved. They all have a density associated with them. So instead of impacting these resources, the density is transferred off and put on another piece of, another area of this parcel, which will result in higher density within that locale on that parcel. But what the city gets is protection of the wetlands. Now the wetlands may not be, you know, the best example, but it is, it is a pretty good one. Perhaps there's a significant forested feature on this property that would be, you know, the city has or the, or, or, or the public has an interest in protecting, okay, well, those density can be transferred from that forested area over to an area that isn't as densely forested, yet that area that's densely forested is going to get developed at a greater density. And the trade-off is the public or will enjoy that densely forested area that it finds important will be preserved and otherwise protected. And the developer gets the density, you know, somewhat what they're looking for, and the public at large gets to enjoy the fact that this area that, that they find important will not get developed. I'm good there. Okay. If I may, if I may add, could, I think every one of y'all have heard me use these terms before. But Ron just described it one of two planning concepts. One is called transfer development rights. And the second is called performance zoning. Uh, transfer development rights doesn't necessarily have to be on that parcel. Uh, a developer could very well, like if it was a forested area, uh, in order to be able to take trees down, he buys 20 acres over somewhere else and puts a conservation easement on it. The rights that that property would have be transferred to his for higher density. There, there are different mechanisms, but you know there are ways. And the the reason I've always preached the uh, performance zoning is. Now you start with a base density. Let's say you, you have rights for zero to six units. And let's say we say your base is two units to an acre. But if you do these things, you get additional density rights. And that way we can protect trees, we can have enhanced buffers, whatever. So, it, but it also keeps us out of legal peril. Okay, Commissioner Sosa, and then we'll wrap this up. Yeah. Well, to touch on that real quick, the gross density, net density, like when we're talking wetlands, if you got a property that's mostly wetlands, but if we have a maximum of six units here, but the majority of the property is wetlands, it, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly, what is it for a wetland, it's one house per 10 acres or something like that? Only in the Osteen area of the city, the Osteen local plan, is it is it the, the wetland areas are limited. 
With regard to the rest of the city, the wetlands are, are controlled, density on wetlands is controlled by your all's future land use map. What, what is that currently? Because I'm not sure. Uh, if it's low density residential, zero to six units per acre. So if a developer wants to build in a wetland, are they okay to build zero to six units if they bring in enough fill or are they not allowed to, to go into that wetland? If they, in theory, if they can drill through the, the rigorous permitting requirements for that, in theory, yes, they could build. In practice, I don't really see that happening to any great extent. We do have individual lots, for example, within the Deltona Lakes PUD, or excuse me, uh, subdivision that may have wetlands that get, that get filled and then they mitigate for that offset and they pay like 75, I think that's the base fee, 75 cents a square foot for every impact. And then the city can go out and use that money to preserve wetlands or enhance wetlands elsewhere. Okay. And then going back to the original question that Mr. King had brought up, you know, talking about population, one, we're the largest city in Volusia County. So population to me should not be an issue. Um, and then as far as to drive the factors of commercial. And then we come to income. I had seen a study within the last six months where Deltona, believe it or not, the median household income is only second in West Volusia, only to DeBerry. So when we're talking income and we're talking population, I think we have both of it. I know uh, Mr. Peters and I have talked a couple times about the income and we're pulling from other sections of other cities, but I know we have population, we have the income, what we don't have is the commercial to keep the people in Deltona. And I think that's where we need to look at, because personally, I know we have a lot of commercial property, most of it's over in District 2. My question is, do we have the infrastructure in place for those parcels, and how are we getting out there to get those parcels developed so that more of the folks, like Commissioner Brett, or Vice Mayor Brett, uh, <laughs> sorry, Marissa, <laughs> Vasquez, um, had alluded that we got more folks leaving. I, I think the last time I had seen it, out of the 45,000 working people in Deltona, 40,000 leave the city each day. So how do we keep them within the city limits to work so that we start getting these restaurants and so forth that everybody is looking to get? Commercial and employment-oriented opportunities. Amazon being a good example. Uh, some other projects that are, are in the pipeline certainly hold some promise to reversing that jobs housing imbalance. Yes. <clears throat> Commissioner Bradford. Yeah, can I just make a comment on that? Um, working for commercial restaurants, I can tell you what I've been told from one of the um, lines we deal with. They looked at Deltona, and their biggest thing was, it's not just, hey, you have a medium income of 65000 and you have 94 residents. It was also, do you have a lunch crowd? So, like um, Vice Mayor said, if you've got your demographics of people leaving the city, and that restaurant's sitting there, so imagine a restaurant say, and I'm just going to throw a place out over by the movie theater, right? Or over on an intersection over there, even by... <coughs> With before an Amazon, they're gonna wanna know, do I have a lunch crowd? You may have a dinner crowd, but that's not gonna do these chain restaurants any good if they can't sustain lunch and, you know, in between and dinner. So that was one of the biggest things that I've been told. It's like, hey, why don't you go to this? We're the largest city, but yet you're over here in Daytona. And that's exactly what they said. You don't have the lunch crowd. While that we've established Amazon and we're establishing the, the different corridors and bringing those in, now they're going, hey, who do I talk to? Because you've got Amazon now, you've got this going in, now you're getting lunch, you've got a hospital, you got that. So now that we're establishing a lunch crowd, I think that's gonna help kick up more exposure for Deltona for those areas. Am I wrong, Ron? I, I, right. I couldn't say it more clear. Mm -hmm, exactly. Right. Well, so That, that was a, a third factor that was always there, but what I'm saying is, We've got the property, we have the existing things, we've got new economic development happening. What do we do to pursue more economic development to bring those restaurants in? 
I, I mean, think how do we keep more folks here in Deltona as opposed to going over to Seminole County or further out across the bridge to Daytona or the east side? You know, what are we doing on an economic standpoint to bring those businesses here? I well, think I think if I can answer that, Commissioner Sosa, I had talked to Mr. Peters a while ago. I don't know if any of you were on the commission at the time. John Wanamaker came in and did an economic development workshop. I know none, a lot, of, pretty much, I don't know if anybody was. And what he did is he brought in he brought in the demographics of what it needs for certain restaurants and what how they how they do that. Similar to what you're saying, Commissioner Bradford. And I think we would benefit from a workshop like that, a clear discussion, um, and have an economic development workshop to see exactly what it is that 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 businesses require to be in here to your point and I think then that would help us all understand as part of this large discussion of what we need to look at and I think that goes not only for restaurants it, it went for a centra care that looked in, to come into the city it went for other businesses and I think if the Commission is in, in in cohesion with having that type of a workshop as a beginning you could help us understand and help the public understand why there's no pick your chain in the city and can I add to that a sore subject that question came up and that's where we came up with the incentive programs for the business that brought us the Amazon mm -hmm. so your exact question is what we did how do we do this how do we get that and who would have thought that when that line was thrown out Amazon was reeled in so not to bring a sore subject up, but that's why that incentive program was done years ago. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> and there's no one on the board. And, and Jump in that. now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you oh. for discussion on this. Uh, Reed, if you'll come on up, please. Uh, uh, Mary. Mary. Uh, you know, everything we got to do, we still got to put the resources to get it. So. This is not a budget workshop, it's just to give you a sense of projection so you can start thinking about that. Let me also say the other priority we did not have time to talk about was transparency. I encourage you to talk about that. A large part is communication, making yep. stuff available. Y'all do all lots of tools, but still you try to work on that. Uh, she's gonna finish and I'm gonna be out of time. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. This was a great discussion. This is a policy level discussion I'll have today. It's exactly the type of discussion uh, y'all need because it really helps you, you move Madam forward. So I want to congratulate Madam Mayor, you. Madam Mayor, my understanding, this was uh, scheduled to 12.30. Am I correct or? Was it 12 or 12.30? That's what I, ha I had on, my, on the calendar, right, 12.30. Right, I, I had 12.30 on my calendar. Well, I, I can talk slower than I can. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was 12, so I was trying to respect it's your time. Stacy, 12? Well, let's do 12.30? Okay. Well, okay. let's do start. Good okay. Time. Mary, so. Okay. Hello, I'd like to draw your attention to this sheet that was left on the dais for you. And this is a, a very um, broad overview of the budget process for 2023. This is the very first step in a very long budget process. Um, we have a long way to go to adoption in September, so this is just a discussion starting point. Uh, the value of this is we're just projecting revenues and expenditures and the effect that it's gonna have on fund balance. Um, and I just wanna sort of break this down so it's a little more digestible. There's four columns on here, and the difference between the columns is the projected millage rate. You can see that from the second line in red. So the first column is based on 7.85 mils, which is the adopted rate for the last several years, and it decreases for the next three columns. Uh, the reason this is important because you will see the effect that it has on the ad valorem taxes that will be generated based on each mill. The rest of the uh, sheet is uh, broken into di five different boxes if you go down by the rows. The first box discusses the taxable value and um, we're projecting a 6% increase in taxable value for the city of Daltona. We're still getting information from the Volusia County property appraiser um, often, and we're not really quite sure where that's gonna shake out yet, we're waiting, but 6% seems to be a conservative um, rate to use. The second box discusses the effect the current year expenses and revenues has on fund balance. The third and fourth boxes 
is a projection of the increases in expenditures and revenues. The last box, the fifth one, is the effect of, of um, capital improvement projects. And this is what um, Mr. Peters was referring to. It has been fully vetted. This information is based on the five-year plan in the current year budget book that you all have. So if you go to the tab that it says capital improvement projects, or five, I'm sorry, the five-year capital plan. That's where you'll find the detail for all of those, and um, that's probably gonna be talked about, discussed fully during the, the rest of the um, budget process. So if we go back to the second box, the fund balance um, as a 930 2021 is $50 million approximately. And um, based on this year's adopted budget, we intend to use about $10 million in fund balance. We anticipate about 3.7 million of revenues in, um, in excess of expenditures. And the rest of the items on here are the set-asides that we have for um, the fund balance. For like the, um, the natural D disaster reserve, we always keep two months operating reserve. Um, and also we have the new emergency river, um, reserve fund of $12 million. Those are all adopted by commission resolution. The one thing that's added on here is this year, 2022, is um, the first year we will be reimbursing Amazon for the tax in um, incentives that we were given them. This is the first of five years. The third box down um, addresses the expenditures. Now, this is the... Um, anticipated increase in expenditures. So we're using a conservative 3% cost, uh, cost of living allowance for personnel. Um, the budget at this point has only one personnel request. Um, we're anticipating a 5% operating expenditure increase, which um, may be conservative um, based on, depending on the way inflation goes. And then also estimated one-time expenses from departments um, based on their budget, very preliminary. So in 2023, then we have the second payment to Amazon. The third item in red on here is um, Mr. Peters has, um, has had discussion on implementing a rental, a rental fee um, imposition on um, landowners. And this is an approximation of the cost it will be to collect those revenues. So now going down to the, thir the fourth box, this is the estimate in the increase in revenues. And this is the first line, it says increase in Avalorum taxes. This is the, um, this is where the different millage rates become important. So if you go from left to right during the columns, at a 7.85 millage rate, we anticipate 1.4 million increase in ad valorem taxes. And as you go down, based on the different millages, down to 447,000 increase in um, property tax revenue. The other um, revenue sources that we get um, are from the state and also state um, revenue sharing and also the half cent sales tax. Uh, the only one that the, we may have a decrease in state telecom fees, and this has been rather up and down the last several years. We're taking some, a somewhat conservative approach on that and anticipating a decrease. Um, also the transport fee from the fire department, that's a conservative. Um, that number has not really been fully vetted, it, vetted yet. Um, the number in red now you see, it's the estimate rental, in, rental income fee. And this is where further discussion is going to come from Mr. Peters, um, because that has not been adopted quite yet. The last item on there is um, the city of Deltona typically holds back 2% of revenues for un unanticipated expenditures that happen throughout the year that are unbudgeted. It gives us a level of cushion for un unexpected events. So um, in the last um, section, section five, these are capital improvement um, projects um, that are part of the five-year plan. So th this is the section that there'll probably be a lot of discussion. So um, to conclude, um, we anticipate an increase in 4.3 in expenditures. 
We an anticipate a 3.4 million increase in revenue. Um, there will probably be, uh, the fund balance will be consumed by 4.7 million for these projects that are in the capital improvement second year. So um, overall, there'll be a decrease in fund balance by approximately $6 million. This is just to give you a general idea of where the expenses and revenues are, will go to give you, you know, so as you go forward with your strategic plan, and decide where you want to um, allocate the resources. This gives you an, a little bit of a roadmap. Commissioner is there Bradford? any questions? Top Commissioner questions. Bradford. Right under millage rate, you have 7.85, 7.75, 7.6, and 7.5. All right. When I look at the estimated taxable value on mm -hmm. each one of these line items, right. they are all identical. Mm -hmm. Well, because... So how are they identical if we're doing a projected forecast? Shouldn't we be included a projected forecast with all the new homes being built? So we have new homes being built, but yet we haven't anywhere on here even put the estimated... What's the projection? Like, I'm... Okay, yeah, and let me explain that. Yeah. Are you look at the very top line? It says prior year final taxable value. No, this I'm looking at estimated. Well, you only have, yes, you have it as fiscal year taxable value. I'd so. like to explain that. Okay. Okay, the first line is final year taxable value. That's what it was. The 6% is the increase in taxable value. That's not going to change for millage rate. That's what... No, increases. it's going to change next year and the year after and the year after and the year after. Oh, no, this is not This is not a year over year. Okay, so this is this just is per just, the millage. This okay. is the next year, just millage. Okay, okay, that's where I was confused. And then fiscal year 22-23 estimated rental fee collections, 3 .7, or 375000 and then we go down to estimated rental fees, new 1.875. Is that not the same thing? No, because the 1.8 is the revenues that will be collected, and we took 20% of that of, as a cost to collect that rental income. Okay, so because that's the cost to collect fees. those, the 375,000 is the cost to collect the 1.875. Correct. Now, is that a little, um, I'm not gonna say pricey, but overinflated being that it's a new program and you still have to reach out to every person, owner who has a rental and say, hey, you need to sign up, you need to register for this program is, are, are we sure this is pretty accurate? Because I know we did this rental program before, and that meant that the city had to find all the rental programs and the owners, and then they had to register those properties and then pay the fee. So I'm, I'm a little leery on that number mm -hmm. to be, as of 1.8 million positive, um, we're already a few months in, and it hasn't even started, nor has it come before the city or um, the commission. So I just, I guess I'm concerned with, I think it's gonna take you a year to get that ramped up, the letters out, and to get people registered, in my personal opinion. Yeah. Mr. Bradford, just so you know, um, in the last year, uh, Deltona Water has gone through every one of our water accounts, had pulled the leases on every one of them. So we have not only a uh, spreadsheet with every rental property, um, but we also have a map that depicts it all. Um, we have been in uh, consultation with a company in South Florida that will take it to the next step. What they do is they look at public databases. Uh, for instance, we have a number of properties where people are claiming homestead, but they're renting the property. There, there are about three databases that we can look at. It is almost automatic, um, and they can actually figure out who's doing homestead violations uh, by claiming homestead but yet renting, and uh, those will be picked up. So we have, right now, we have a, um, a, a fresh sheet that we can be putting out letters on a moment's notice to the ones that we know of. Right. Uh, the company, uh, ProChamps, I believe it is out of South Florida that we have spoken to, we would piggyback on a contract they have with other municipalities. And so what we would do is, at this point, we would schedule them for, to do a business tax receipt as a rental. Correct. Uh, That's what we did before, right? By next January. Okay. 
and then the actual infections, what we're looking at right now, would be every other year starting in 2023, and they would hire a private home inspector, licensed home inspector, to do an inspection every two years. My thought right now, if you have an even address, you'll be in 23. If you have an odd address, you'll be in 24. And because I don't want to overload the number right. of home inspections out there. But you know, we would not do any inspections. Uh, that's always one of the biggest problems with doing this is you have to grow the building department so large and then people think government just being onerous. No, what we're going to do is we're going to have the private uh, landlord take care of hiring a registered home inspector to do the inspection. That way we have evidence that the property is being kept up. So it, it takes care of the, the uh, inspection part of it as well as the, the impact on our operation on those rental properties. So I think we have come up with the best of all worlds. Uh, we'll be coming to you with a uh, ordinance to put it in place. If it's an ordinance or a resolution, I'm not sure. But we have done a lot of work in preparation for this to occur this year. Okay. No, I was just curious because when you're when you're rolling it out the first year, you know, like you said, you've got a list, but now you've got to get them to get in there and do the BTR. And then you're also gonna have homeowners that they're holding the the rental in their name. So the, the water bill may be in the, the homeowner's name and not the tenant's name. So it's it's almost like how do you reach those individuals? So yeah, I, I know this with, has been with, a, a heck of a task, and we with, can talk about that during a workshop. With, with the database, if we'll be able to figure those out. Okay. No, I, no, I think it's great. I just don't want us to. I want a re realistic number. Is that that's all I'm asking for? Yeah. Any other questions? No. Thank you. Thanks. Go ahead. Get to my slides for a minute. You have. I'd like to marry this with our discussion about transparency. Uh, and I talked to this one earlier, uh, so I'm going to focus on organizational capability. I'll let you do it. I'm going to start this from a way that may seem unusual to you. Uh, I've recently been reading layman's versions of neuroscience. I don't have the knowledge or skill to read technical versions because these are folks who are PhDs and MB, MDs in neurology uh, and chemistry. But what these folks can do now is they can take a blood sample and they can determine the level of chemistry of various chemicals in our body and locate that in various portions of our brain. Okay, so that's sort of spooky in some ways, but it is how we work. And what they have found, particularly one gentleman in particular has done it, is there's a real relationship between certain chemicals and our level of trust and organizational performance. Now, how does that relate to transparency? Let's just take this morning. You guys didn't have some documents. Now that wasn't a major crisis, but it did sort of raise the issue. Well, why, why aren't we getting something? <laughs> you know, it, it harmed trust a little bit, you know. If you have that over and over and over again, you start to have a loss of trust. One of the challenges of local governments is, and government in particular, go all the way up to the great big Washington, is the public doesn't have a lot of trust in us, you know, uh, for a variety of reasons. Some legitimate, some not. Uh, so one of your challenges and one of the strategic plan is how do you build trust in this community so the community will support actions which you have to take, which may cost them money or may seem problematic somehow. So transparency, I think, is, is a really important issue uh, because it, it affects the level of trust externally and in the communication, in, inside the organization. So. I don't have time today to talk about how we do all that, uh, but it is something that you know I would encourage you to think about. Some of it is simple, like just you know everything's public. You have the documents, easy to access. 
You know, a lot of uh, communities are investing in software where their financial records are totally transparent. You can go in, you can see anything you want to see. Uh, you obviously can make public record requests here uh, for all you want. But, you know, that's an important thing. Uh, and, and it impacts everybody here. It impacts you. We do a very hard job on folks at your sales in Florida because we don't allow you to talk to each other in meaningful ways at times. You've got to do it on the dice. When I work in Texas, it's so wonderful. I can take your seven. I can meet with three of you just privately. And, you know, if a couple of you are having problems with each other, well, you can sit and work it out. That's hard to do on the dice and the TV and all that. You know, it's just reality. So we make it very difficult. We make it easy for the level of distrust among our elected bodies to go up below what it really is. And so it just is. That's our reality. That's how we have to work here. Uh, but I do want to just say, you know, please don't minimize that word uh, because it really affects what happens way out in the field, <laughs> whether people trust that they're being treated well and respected and listened to and all those things. It affects your public as customers, it affects your employees as people who work together. So, uh, I, I, you know, for whatever it's worth, uh, if you want to go read that stuff, it's really interesting and you can find stuff that people like I can understand, <laughs> although they will have a few chemical symbols up there that are far beyond me. <laughs> uh, but it, but it is something to, to really look at. Uh, I've talked about that. Uh, you know, Barry talked about the financial capacity. The organizational capability is the culture and skills. Uh, Y'all talked about that earlier in terms of having enough people to do the job, having the right people to do the job, that's part of it. The organizational culture of everybody working together toward that end is important. Uh, and as I said, organizations that have a high trust culture do have better performance. These are sort of documented scientific studies, not just social scientists as myself, but real physical scientists who've got, you know, all the really hard stuff there to prove it. So let's just talk for a few minutes about policy and administration trust. Uh, you know, that's your employees sitting there. You know, everybody else is his employees. Uh, and to the degree that the manager can trust y'all and he, you can trust him, this organization is going to work better, you know. And we all have to take a part in that, you know, be responsible for what our behavior may create trust or distrust. Uh, it's, it's just people. You know, we all do things at times that, you know, perhaps none of you have ever gotten your spouse upset, but I do that regularly, you know, because I didn't say something or explain something and why am I doing this, you know. Uh, and so I, I think about it just a personal relationship. I mean, what am I doing that helps people understand and trust me? The more you can be transparent, the more you can say, here's what I'm trying to do, here's what I want to achieve, here's where I'm coming from. Let me tell you, managers value that so much, and I'm not talking solely about John. Managers, a lot of managers have to spend half their time trying to figure out where their commission's coming from. You know, if the commission could just be more straightforward about it, they can figure out what to do and all. So I encourage you, you know, really communicate directly with John. I'm concerned about this. I want this to happen, whatever it is. The more he understands where you're coming from, the better job he can do from you. He needs to do the same for you. You know, a lot of the questions, they were about the status of the strategic plan, which is good. That's why we had this. But, you know, they, he needs to communicate to you all that stuff so that you know what's going on and you know why it is. It's also very helpful uh, that if everybody stays in their lanes. You know, y'all are policymakers, he's an administrator. At one level, policy is easy where you approve the budget, you approve ordinances, you do stuff like that. But there's an ambiguous level to what is policy. It really is. It's not very clear. Uh, and, some t and all of you are here because you've been active in the community, you're leaders in the community, you've been recognized and valued of that. Uh, but when you come here, you have to take on a different role. <laughs> you know, you have to sit here looking at the community as a whole and looking at the resources. And so sometimes, you know, it's hard to define what my policy role is from when I'm out there in the community and I've been a leader on some issues. Uh, and that's just not, not always easy to separate. I understand that. Uh, but I would encourage you to really think about that. You know, as a policymaker, you know, you don't solve the administrative stuff. That's his job. <laughs> Your job is to tell him, <laughs> you know, we got a problem here. Everybody looks at you and expects they can pick up the phone and you'll have it fixed tomorrow. 
well, the world really doesn't work that way, you know. And so the more you can refer, I'm going to have the manager call you about it, the whole system works better. So I would just encourage you to, to do that as you get the various pressures that the community puts on you about that. And I understand them, you know. Uh, so that's my whole talk. I'm going to let you out of school a little bit early here, but I'll be happy mm -hmm. to respond to questions. I got a question. All right. Anybody else on the board? You're in. Okay. I don't know if this happened when I was on vacation, but I got a few phone calls. Mm -hmm. So I just need to find out since we're talking about transparency. I had a couple of residents call me upset. Mm -hmm. And they said that maybe they misunderstood it. Was it discussed that the residents are to buy, not go to the city commissioners and to go directly to staff? Anybody hear that? The I had a couple of people question me and they said, hey, we were told that I shouldn't go to you, that I should be going directly to the city manager or to staff, and they said, we elected you because you are our liaison. You're the person between that. Does anybody know about that? No? Okay. Uh, I don't I'm, know. I was hoping it was just rumor, but that was, that was a little concerning to me because I'm like, no, you can always come to me. If you have a question, we're your liaison. We are your person I, I that think, you can come to. Did you want to say something, Commissioner? I think at the last meeting, Mr. Peters talked about us not directing staff. And he said that we should start going to the executive secretaries and giving them information and let them take care of it instead of going to Mr. Peters with it. So they misunderstood. It's not that they're saying, hey, you can't go talk to your commissioner. If when we have something, they want us to go no. through. Okay, gotcha. Thank we you for clarification. That's why I said I need to clarify this because I can't be believe they would say that. Us. Right. They're supposed to be coming to us, but when all of us up here have four people that are coming to us, and we need to talk to Mr. Peters, Mr. Peters can't get done what he's got to do today, so he's asked us to go through the executive secretaries and let them direct whatever it is that needs to be done to the staff that needs to get the information. Thank you for clarifying that. And that's another reason I wanted to do it on recording because I think it was a misunderstanding on how they interpreted it. It was. And when those I little misunderstandings happen, you've got that mm -hmm. going down and it trickles and it gets an in infestation. So mm -hmm. that's why I wanted that clarified. Thank you. Commissioner McCool. She just, just took a sip of her coffee. Thank you, Honorable Mayor. <laughs> I want to know, I do it half tongue in cheek and half serious. Okay. I yeah. am an entrepreneur. Uh -huh. I'm an activist. Uh -huh. I'm used to getting things done. Uh -huh. I'm also respectful of authority. Mm -hmm. I'm respectful of my lane because I do not excel in every area, although sometimes I act like I do. I know what my place is most times. Okay. And I try to do that. Sure. Try not to deviate. I really do try, uh -huh. okay? So I'm needing to understand, and it doesn't have to be explained today because I'm gonna need a playbook and visuals, okay? <laughs> I need to understand. What is my lane, okay? okay? Mm -hmm. A resident calls me with a problem, and at that moment, I'm faced with a decision. What do I delegate, mm -hmm. okay? This is my business head thinking. Mm -hmm. What do I delegate, and what do I take care of myself? Mm -hmm. A resident emails me, no one else. Commissioner McCool, a builder was here, they poured concrete all over my driveway. Mm -hmm. I um, have called them a couple of times and they've still not gotten back to me. So my, my property is trash, my mailbox is trash, what do I do? This is Dana making the decision. Oh, I have the number right here on the permit box. Call them, tell them. I have a resident with the problem, you messed up their property, go fix it, mm -hmm. right? Or do I give this? to them, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and then farm it out, mm -hmm. and I feel I'm wasting productivity time, right, because of that, 
So I try to stay in my lane, but I also try to handle things that I can handle with a phone call. To me, that makes sense. It's productivity man hours. I'm not wasting staff hours. I'm not having to circle back the wagons. Sometimes government makes sense to me and I like rules. Sometimes it does not. So I think that not today, there's a lot to chew on, but I need to understand what my role is. I need to understand what my role is on social media because I'm sorry, but it's here, people. Mm -hmm. Social media is here. I signed a social media policy that says I will not disparage the city in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Mm -hmm. Never have I ever, mm -hmm. but I'm still vocal, right? I need to understand those things. As a commissioner, we're baptized, given the book, have expectations, sit here, do I be quiet, do I not be quiet? Sometimes it's like a tennis match. So there needs to be more discussion on what my role is. I do, contrary to popular belief, know how to keep my mouth shut. But I also know how to open it. So I'm trying to find that balance, be respectful of that man sitting right over there, because sometimes he wants to throw things at me, and I know it. Sometimes I want to throw things at him, and I know it. Exactly. He's not the only one. Ex ex yeah, ex that's exactly. I really am trying to be an effective leader to stay in my lane. Same thing here. The public perception is that we're we're individual commissioners up here, but we are all working for a common good. We don't get much time to express our fondness for one another because then we're talked about, you know what I mean? And we're so colloquial up here, right, and have respect. I express my opinion and my opinion own, only. I protect my city, but I also protect my residents. So take with you what you will, but we really do. I've been here a year now, and sometimes I still don't know what my job is, you know? Well, all I can say is I would really encourage y'all to spend some time on that. Mm -hmm. I, it, commissions as a body don't tend to talk about that and everybody works on their own definition of what it is I can, uh, I can and sometimes that. that works fine and sometimes you get cross purposes on it I so it, it's well worth uh, a conversation if you will take the time on this. I can I can answer that question if you want okay oh. shine bright like a diamond okay here we go I'll, I'll answer that question by telling you a story about something that happened to me. Citizen calls. This is what's going on at my place. It's awful. I don't like it. What is the city going to do about it? I need things fixed right now. I hate talking on the phone. I just do. I go visit them. I don't even, I don't even see the man yet, but I look around and go, oh, this is terrible. It's awful. I wouldn't want to have that in my front yard. I would want that fixed. Got out of my truck, took about six or eight pictures. Guy comes out, talked for a little while, found out what the situation was. Thank you very much. I left. I came to City Hall. I went upstairs. I got with Sandy. I said, Sandy, let me email you these pictures. Something has to be done here. Sandy got back with me uh, yesterday. No, that's not true. Thursday. And said, staff is taking care of that. They're working on it. That's it. That's it. Okay. I was taken care of. But I didn't direct any staff. I went to the executive secretaries and said, this is what's going on. This is the address. It's actually affecting three houses on the street, not just this person. And here's pictures to show what it is that needs to be fixed. Okay, we'll take care of it. And that was it. Mm -hmm. Again, I would just encourage you all to have a discussion about those Herb, processes. And can I jump in? I want Vice, to say Vice something. Mayor wants to say something real quick. I want to say something, Mr. Peters. Yeah. So. Yeah. I agree with uh, Commissioner King, and yes, uh, Commissioner, this was something that um, Mr. Peter brought up on your, when you were not here on, at the meeting. Um, to have one place to go to uh, so that our emails and requests don't sit in his inbox until he gets the time to review and disperse. And I've had very good turnaround mm -hmm. dealing with, directly with Sandy and Sharon and the same thing that uh, Commissioner King is saying, 
I have sent something out today and tomorrow I'll get a response back either from Sandy or Sharon saying it's being worked on or a picture saying it's completed. Um, and like Ms., you know, Commissioner King, I also go to the sites to see if it's true because I don't want to put something out there that's not um, gonna be a problem for our, our staff. And the other thing, um, Commissioner McCool, if I might, if I may, a lot of the questions that you asked at the end are only answered through ethics training because that's the rules that we have to follow up here. It's not what Mr. Peter says, it's what the ethics class training tells us that we have to follow. So maybe we should consider having another class at the center. Um, well, there's one coming up there's in one Daytona, February. there's a third yeah. one. Right, go I, I can't make it to, but that, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just trying to answer your question. That's that's the most legal answer that we can, that I can come up with, and I don't know if the other commissioners will agree on that. But thank you, and I, and I get that for your input and your leadership, both of you. And 98% of the stuff, that is what happens. I followed protocol by sending these issues to all four of the emails. And ethics training, I do ethics training every year. Again, I follow the rule, um, but there are things, um, I, I'm giving you a broad description of, of, because there are things that are subjective, and I think that, um, I think that it's different, maybe sometimes, when you are, uh, and which I am learning, when you're an entrepreneur and an activist, as to when you worked in corporate structure. When you work in corporate structure, you're used to listening to other people, and you're used to things taking a, a while, right? Our staff is professional, and the same, I've had the same results. The things that I send are answered immediately. That's not the, that is not the thing. What I am looking for leadership and guidance on, and I'm trying to be better about, is taking the bull by the horns. Never done anything to put the city in peril, right? However, I would like to be better. So I do attend ethics training, um, and I do follow that protocol. I am trying to strike that balance between working in, in government structure and coming from private a sector. It's really hard. If you're a business owner, you think one way than you do if you've worked under someone else in a corporate structure. Sorry, that's just the way that it is. So that's all I was saying. The staff is excellent. Sandy Sharon, you're not going to find anybody better in Volusia County. We have a great city manager. I understand that. Part of my issue is being protectionist, trying to like, oh, that's something that, you know what I mean? There's that. Stacy's fantastic. I mean, she's like on the ball. So it's not a matter of not trusting my people. It's a matter of not overstepping. That's where I get in trouble. So that's what I'm talking about. What is my job? What can I do? What can I not do? Further talk on that would be fantastic. If, may, if I may jump in here. Um, I think this is a great learning opportunity. You, you told me about what you did, and it was fine, it, because you did tell me. But this is the advice I give, and this is why it's important to me, and I get passionate about it, is part of my job is to improve processes. And you know, that may have been a situation where my co-compliance people were working on it, or my uh, building department was working on it, and you know, you, you got it fixed, but you know, Sharon may have reached out to somebody and said, hey, we need to get the concrete fixed or whatever. And because you got it taken care of, I did not, I was not able to learn if these people would get it done. And that's part of my job is to improve processes and make sure that people are accountable for their job. I, I appreciate the comments that were made by uh, several of you all because we do. We have an incredible group of people. The two ladies up there are unbelievable. I'm damn lucky to have them. And, um, and you know, they, they reach out and then, you know, all these directors, they get these things and they get them taken care of, usually next day. And if they can't, they, they could, there's Johnny on the spot to call up and explain what the issue is, and then we will get back with you and let you know. So I know you meant well, but sometimes 
um, it, it impacts my ability to improve operations. That's all. And That's look at this teachable moment. That, my friends, is a teachable moment I've been talking about for two years and always staying open to teachable moments. Okay, Mr. Ramos, so thank, Ma Madam so Madam thank you for Madam that. Mayor, if I can just jump in real quick. Like, I think it's not just an educational opportunity for us, but it's also for our residents. And I think the more that we can be consistent Kind of like to what Mr. King says, right? If I get a phone call, my first question is, have you contacted the city? If you haven't, then that's the first direction you need to do. And I think if we can be consistent about that, then our residents are gonna realize that there is a process. Yes, you can call us. Yes, you can call me. But if you have not gone through the city, you're just making another layer. Because I am gonna have to call the city. But if you call the city and you've called the city, then my next reaction is, okay, Mr. Peters, mm -hmm. this was brought to your attention, what's happening? And then you can follow up. But I think it's a two-way street. It's us from up here and also for our residents to realize, yes, you can contact us, but for me, the first line is city, and then we can follow up. Yes, sir. Thank you. Babe. All right. Well, thank you for the morning. I've enjoyed it. Wish you well. Have a great year. Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Marlowe, and thank you to city staff, Mr. Peters, to Stacy, to uh, clerk's office, and all the directors that sat here for their Saturday morning and into the afternoon. Mr. Paradise and Mary, thank you again for your presentations and all your hard work to make this happen. We appreciate you, and I'm uh, grateful that you're all here and part of this process. We will make the city work. We have direction. Thank you, everyone. We are adjourned.